softball all four years and competing in the competitive showcase softball. She is the student liaison for Mount Dora High at the Chamber of Commerce meetings, a member of the Jefferson, Clubs, or Jefferson Awards Club, and has been a participant in the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. She intends to play collegiate softball at Agnes Scott College and major in biochemistry on a pre-veterinary track. So welcome, and we'll hear from you in just a few minutes. Also tonight, I'd like to introduce Chelsea McCurdy. Welcome to Chelsea. She is our Rookie Teacher of the Year from Lost Lake Elementary School. She has taught second grade at Lost Lake for a total of three years. She has helped refine math blueprints and has coached other second grade teachers to help improve the learning experience for students at Lost Lake. Ms. McCurdy received a BS in Early Childhood Development and, ed and Education from the University of Florida in 2015 and her Master's in Educational Leadership from the University of Central Florida in December 2018. She was also a Lake County Standards Academy presenter where her areas of focus were elementary math, K-2 instruction, relationships between Florida standards, and how the curriculum and pedagogy can move students towards college and career readiness. So we'll look forward to hear from her as well. And in the back we have with us tonight Sheriff Deputy James Finley. He is our School-Related Employee of the Year finalist from Tavares Middle School, so welcome to him. He serves as the school... Oh, yep. <laughs> Although we'll invite you to come up whenever you're ready as well. We'll hear from you in a few minutes. He serves as the School Resource Deputy at Tavares Middle and has been described as a staff member who is well-respected by students, parents, and colleagues. He was assigned to the school only seven months ago, but has already built a rapport with families by beginning and ending his day in the parent drop-off and pick-up line, giving out his famous high fives. The administration describes him as a role model and mentor, and his visibility, visibility and volunteering is noticed and appreciated. So welcome to you three this evening. And also with us, I'd like to welcome uh, House Representative Jennifer Sullivan. She's here this evening, and appreciate you being here as well. Board members, we're at our changes, amendments, additions, deletions to the agenda. I do want to make you guys know, um, make a note, we are moving the reports this evening um, up in front of our public input um, for the courtesy of the people that are here to speak and receive recognition. We've also been asked to move item 4.01 after 4.03. So we're not removing it, we're just moving it down behind two of the recognitions for one of our staff members. Are there any other changes, amendments? I'd like to pull 8.07. 8.07? And 8.08 .08 by Mr. Gamble. Any others? Okay. Seeing none, Superintendent. All right, I recommend approval of the minutes from the school board workshop April 16th, 2018, the executive session for collective bargaining April 23rd, 2018, and the regular school board meeting April 23rd, 2018. Have the recommendation? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. All right, at this time, we would like to invite up Dr. Weisskopf. Good evening, Superintendent, school board members. Um, I am honored to be here tonight for the third time to um, recognize high-impact teachers in Lake County Schools. Tonight we will be, we will be honoring Region 3's high-impact teachers, and I'm going to also invite Wayne Cockcroft, our Regional Executive Director for Region 3, to help me out tonight. As you know, the Florida Department of Education has identified 97 teachers from Lake County Schools as being among those with the highest impact on student learning in the state. This determination is made after an analysis of their former students' performance on statewide standardized assessments. It looks at three years of data from 2014 to 2017 in the subjects of English language arts grades 4 to 10, math grades 4 to 8, and algebra 1 grades 8 and 9. Whether in a classroom where students arrived already high achieving or a classroom where students were underperforming, the efforts of these teachers provided inspiration and opportunities to students that may have been otherwise inaccessible. Today we shine the spotlight on these teachers from Region 3. 
So as your name is called, please come to the front to receive a certificate and a recognition pin as a way of, our say, of saying thank you for your leadership and for preparing our students for a promising future. Once all the names are called, our board members would like to shake your hand. Then we ask that you follow Sherry Owens into the rotunda to have your picture taken. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present to you the Lake County High Impact Teachers from Region 3. And I apologize in advance for some name debacles, so if you'll help me out, I'd appreciate it, okay? Um, from Cecil Gray Middle School, we have Alan Slayton, Flatten, Slayton, see? So if you do have a school administrator from that school, you're welcome to come up and receive for them if you'd like. I also have Tracy Martin. Matthew Miller. And is it Latasha Owsley? Megan Romano, from Claremont Elementary, I have Deborah Dvorak, from Cypress Ridge Elementary, I have Mitchell Blackburn. Tiffany Forsyth and Starlina Olson. From East Ridge High School, I have Marella, is it Junkshi? The Junkshi. How'd I do? I'm just hoping they recognize it so I can <laughs> Amanda Lee Ramirez. And Tabitha, is it Zanger? Zangry. From East Ridge Middle School, I have Greg Antill. <laughs> Catherine Frederick, Frederick. <laughs> Matthew Lima. <laughs> Allison Mace. Gregory Sergey and Neville Silvera. From Grassy Lake Elementary, I have Nalani Benjamin. Jenny Punsack, <laughs> Wendy Rosar, <laughs> and Jamelia White. <laughs> so if you want to move the line down just slightly, you may have to go all the way to Miss Shepard Miller. From Groveland Elementary, I have Charles Canolt. <laughs> Natasha Weiss. <laughs> From Lake Manila High, I have Robin Bennett. <laughs> Kara Ewing. And Danielle Green.
And from Lost Lake Elementary, I have Jennifer Ackerman. Anika Days. And Samantha Walker. From Mascot Charter Elementary, I have Laura Ann Bledsoe. And Rebecca Lynn Gomez. From Minneola Charter Elementary, I have Ruth Ann Ball. Wait, I'm giving you a minute to catch up. <laughs> Melinda Gayelia. Gayelella. And Jessica Haynes. From Pine Ridge Elementary, I have, is it Dinah or Dina? Dina, Dina Lally. <laughs> Stacy Mims. <laughs> Jennifer Rodriguez. <laughs> and Meredith, Meredith Silvestris. From Sawgrass Bay Elementary, I have Olivia Calandro. And from South Lake High, I have Wanda Albert. And Alexandra Ramirez. From Windy Hill Middle, I have Kevin Frank, Jr. <laughs> Richard Prosse, Prosse, Prosse. <laughs> Cynthia Rupp. <laughs> and Ebony Johnson. And from South Lake Imagine Charter, I have Dana Grieta. Christopher Hink. And Melissa Perkins. So let's give it up one more time. These 49 high impact teachers. From them to come back to you so if you wouldn't mind it what oh that might be easier wouldn't it yeah so maybe the board's going to come to you instead of you going to them yeah, sure, why not? and again congratulations this is one of the best days of in my year so i appreciate all that you do
if you find 49, we'll head outside to the rotunda. They'll get your picture in one large group. Thank you. Barry's Middle School, which all three of my kids go there, so kind of worked out to go to that one, so I appreciate you saying that. It's been an adventure. <laughs> we have much. Yeah, it be, uh, looks like that's going to happen. We just got to find the personnel. The problem is, who do you got? So all right, at this point in time, we would like to invite um, Carmen Colon back up for... Scott Strong Memorial Foundation. There we go. All right. Different side of the room tonight. Yeah, I was looking for you over there. Uh, Chairman, school board, um, superintendent. Mm -hmm. It is with great honor that mm -hmm. Dean Simmons, who is joining me, uh, and I are able to present the Scott Strong Memorial Scholarship winners tonight. Um, the committee is comprised of uh, Lori Strong Richardson, Lisa Jordae, Stephanie Strong, Stephen Strong, and myself, as well as our Chairman, Dean Simmons. This year we have five ref uh, recipients that will be receiving $11,000. Scott Strong served as the Lake County School Board member from 2000 to 2008, and he was named the State of Florida School Board Member of the Year in 2008. He was a staunch supporter of his family, his community, and education. To date, the Scott Strong Memorial Scholarship Fund has distributed $91,250 to 90 recipients. As I call the name of our award winners, I'd ask them to join me at the podium. Our first young lady is Elena Monahan. Elena is receiving $1,000. She's a senior at Leesburg High School, and she plans to attend the University of Florida and major in pharmaceuticals. <laughs> Our next recipient is Alexander Newborn. He's receiving $1,000. Alexander is a senior at Tavares High School. He plans on attending the University of South Florida and pursue, pursue a master's degree in the field of computer hardware engineering. It might be a good time to step up right now, Alex. <laughs> um, Reagan Young, $2,000. Okay, okay. Reagan is a senior at Leesburg High School. She plans on attending Florida State University, where she will be majoring in nursing and ultimately become a nurse anesthetist. Awesome. Jeanette Getchell, $2,000. Jeanette is a senior at Eustis High School. She plans to attend the University of South Florida and major in communication disorders continuing on to receive a doctorate in audiology. Congratulations. <laughs> and our final recipient, and I will say that this is only the second time in the nine years of this award that the committee was so impressed with this young lady that they awarded her a $5,000 scholarship, wow. and her name is Sarah Hopper. Sarah is a senior at Eustis High School. She plans on attending the University of Central Florida and receiving her degree in psychology. The combined average GPA of these five amazing young people is 4.956. There is obviously not a doubt in the committee's mind that these young people will achieve anything that they aspire to. Congratulations. Yes.
the Educational Foundation's annual Scott Strong Memorial Scholarship Tournament will be held on October 12, 2018 at Mission Inn, and proceeds from this tournament will be used to replenish the scholarship account. Um, Chairman, would you like yes. to? We would love that opportunity, yes. Okay, at this point in time, I would like to invite Doretha Cole for the superintendent's reading challenge. Reading challenge. Tonight we are going to be recognizing um, the superintendent's reading challenge. This year we had 40 schools participate in the reading challenge, 26 elementary schools including Lake Hills, 22,700 and I'm sorry, 22,176 students read uh, for our elementary schools. We had eight middle schools uh, with 1,476 students reading, and six high schools with 621 students reading. We had a total of 24,303 students reading 493,747 books. So tonight we will be uh, recognizing the winners that uh, read with 90% or higher uh, percent of their population meeting that challenge. So we will start with um, Astatua. Um, we have three, we, we're in the middle of Steam Bowl, as you know, well, I shouldn't say middle. We started today, and our plaques came, and we had a little um, miscue in some of them, so we're missing three, but we have somebody going to get them right now, so if we call you and there's not a plaque, you will have it before you leave tonight, I promise. So, we'll start with um, Astatua Elementary. <laughs> Beverly Shores Elementary. Cypress Ridge Elementary. Eustace Elementary. <coughs> Eustace Heights Elementary. Grassy Lake Elementary. Groveland Elementary. <laughs> Rhymes Early Learning Center. <laughs> Round Lake Charter. Sawgrass Bay Elementary, <laughs> Tavares Elementary, <laughs> and Umatilla Elementary. Thank you. We would like the opportunity to shake their hands as well, Mrs. Smith. Oh, I'm sorry, and I've okay. got one very, very important oh. recognition that we have tonight. Okay. We have a special recognition plaque for Lake Hills. Oh. They had 30 students who participated this year. They read almost 700 books, awesome. and one.
and one of their students read 120 books by herself. Okay. I think it was. At this point in time, I would like to invite up Chris Dawson and Angie Langley um, from Gray Robinson and Representative Sullivan as well. Legislatively. Good evening. What a hard act to follow with all of these amazing teachers and schools and students. Um, I'm Angie Langley, and I want to thank you again, Superintendent and the School Board, for the opportunity to represent Lake County Schools in Tallahassee and carry your message through the halls um, throughout Tallahassee. We, this was an interesting session. It seems like we say that every year. This is our second year representing you guys. Every year there are some interesting challenges. This year, unfortunately, it was um, the Parkland tragedy that came you know, toward the end of, of everything, and so that really just put the brakes on, on everything as we know it. So we're thrilled that we still had um, positive performance for you guys, which Chris is going to go um, more into. But, you know, there were cuts all across the budget, so for us to be able to have um, maintained anything that we were working for, there's a very, very big um, ho hooray on that. So uh, with that, I will um, – oh, and I also want to make sure that we uh, – our board members and the public know that our – um, Lake County Legislative Delegation really, really works hard for us. So when you see um, our state representatives and senators, please thank them because they really went to bat for us with, with the um, goals that Lake County Schools had, it's specifically Representative Jennifer Sullivan and Senator Dennis Baxley. So we thank them for their support. They're a, a joy to work with. All right, thank you, Angie. Uh, Superintendent Cornegay and members of the board, I'm Chris Dawson with Gray Robinson and want to again echo uh, Angie's comments. Thank you for letting us represent Lake County Schools in Tallahassee. Uh, as a product of Florida's public education system and a son of a public education teacher in Florida, uh, I have known from a very early age how important public education is. And so I want to thank all of you for what you do to help keep our public education one of the top in the state. Uh, as Angie said, session is always challenging. It's 60 days to go through thousands of bills and pass a somewhere in the neighborhood of $87 billion budget. Uh, added to that this year, of course, is an election year, so there's a little bit of extra drama and spice that goes along with any election year. Uh, we've also had some big issues happen over the last uh, 12 months. We had a hurricane hit Florida in Irma. We had a hurricane ravage nearby Puerto Rico, and so those issues were front and center. We're also in the middle of the worst opioid crisis, uh, with Florida being ground zero. And so there are a lot of issues that were bouncing around the halls of Tallahassee this session. And of course, on February 14th, everything changed with the Parkland tragedy. And that, that's really what will be uh, the mark of this session moving forward. Uh, but it wasn't all uh, sad news. There were some very important wins for Lake County schools particularly. And I'd love to go through just a couple of those with you real quick. Uh, this is to supplement the written memo, of course, that we've provided. Uh, but first and foremost, uh, the number one big win uh, for the county and, and for our public school system, the uh, Leesburg High Destination Lake Program, the Construction Academy, uh, just a fantastic win. As Angie mentioned, you know, there, were, there were a lot of cuts and budget tightening towards the end of session. Uh, the Parkland bill also ended up taking an additional $400 million out of discretionary revenue to spend. And so to be able to come back and report that we were uh, successful in getting over $800,000 appropriated for the Destination Lake project is absolutely fantastic, and it lays a foundation for us to build upon in years to come. Uh, one thing that I would point your attention to as we look at the skills gap in apprenticeship, um, 
current agricultural commissioner, Adam Putnam, announced today that one of his top priorities that he's going to announce for his campaign is looking at workforce development and public education. So Lake County Schools is the tip of the spear in this effort statewide, and we should all give ourselves a pat on the back for the tremendous success we expect to see out of our students coming through this program. The second win I'll talk about uh, is related to the compression adjustment on the education finance program. Of course, we know that there's a formula that establishes the per pupil spending in the state, and it is, uh, there's a differentiating factor that is used by counties, so some counties receive more than others. Uh, we were successful in working with your delegation to get a compression allocation made this year. Uh, the legislature appropriated $57 million for this effort statewide to help those counties who fall below the statewide average in uh, full-time spending uh, per pupil. And so Lake County Schools is set to receive almost $3 million of additional money out of that compression allocation. And so that was a big win. It could not have been done without the help of Representative Sullivan and Senator Baxley. And so you know, working with your delegation, that really was a fantastic opportunity, again, for Lake County Schools. Uh, finally, I will touch briefly on the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Public uh, Safety Can Act. Oh, yeah. Can I just real, yeah, is that recurring or not? Because we were having that discussion. I will check my notes and confirm with you, but I believe that is a non-recurring appropriation for this year. But I will verify and confirm. Uh, so the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Act, as we all know, February 14th, happened towards the end of session, and so it was a unique uh, situation where the legislature is actively meeting when such a tragedy happened. Uh, of course, there was strong political will and strong demand for action, and so the, the uh, this important piece of legislation did pass in the final week of session. Uh, we all remember the marathon floor sessions. That the, the Senate even had a special Saturday session to debate this bill. Uh, there were some controversial provisions, particularly those related to gun control, uh, but I'll focus specifically on the parts that uh, impact public education in Lake County schools. Uh, there was a $400 million appropriation tied to this bill. Uh, $160 million of that was for additional funding for school resource officers. $99 million is for school hardening projects that will be administered as grants to the Department of Education. There was a $75 million appropriation for additional mental health counselors in schools, as well as a $28 million appropriation for mental health service teams statewide, and those are sort of crisis teams that are able to intervene uh, in, and hopefully prevent these types of tragedies from happening. There was also an additional $68 million appropriated for the Coach Aaron Fife Guardian Program. Uh, that is a program that has been controversial. It would allow, uh, in certain circumstances where the school board and the sheriff agree, for there to be armed personnel in school after uh, they go through a rigorous training program. There are a lot more questions and answers at this point as, as the Department of Education is rulemaking right now to bring the Stoneman Douglas Act into effect. Uh, our team is actively working with, of course, the board and the superintendent and your staff to get questions answered, raise issues where we see them, and, and have an open dialogue with DOE as, these, uh, uh, as this act and as this money is implemented going into the next fiscal year, which begins July 1. So uh, with that, just final thoughts, and, and Angie already touched on it, you have a fantastic delegation here in Lake County, and really these successes would not be possible without the hard work that folks like Representative Sullivan put in. So it's our, priv our privilege to work with them on your behalf. Uh, and again, we're always available. Uh, I'll take any questions if there are, but I know you've got a packed agenda tonight, and Representative Sullivan uh, will be following me. So I'll stand down and let her come to the mic. Well, I want to start out first by thanking the, the teachers and administrators in the room, because we wouldn't be here today without the teachers that we have in Lake County. So thank you for all that you guys do. It's been a privilege to work with the board members and especially Superintendent Cornegy. Um, as soon as she came on the scene here in Lake County, I immediately went and met with her in her office, and she has been a pleasure to work with from day one. We sat down, I asked her her priorities, and I said, what can I do to m help make those happen? And that's really where the Construction Academy for Leesburg High School came out of that meeting. I filed over 10 different appropriation projects and I'm pleased to share that that was my one priority and that's the only one that got funded. So <laughs> you know where I put all my political capital uh, this session because there were a lot of different things going on in Tallahassee. I had um, 10 bills personally that I filed and the three that passed uh, the House, Senate, and were signed by the governor were my three education bills. So that's really what I've been passionate about working with. And I will tell you, especially with our superintendent we have here, every time a bill would come up that I would reach out for input, feedback, thoughts, 
she would respond timely and with great feedback. So know that she's working really hard for you, and we have a great relationship there in Tallahassee. I'm really excited about the $886,000 for the Leesburg Construction Academy, and I think that's just the beginning um, for the opportunities here in Lake County to get academies in our high school where students can get certifications, and especially those that don't plan on going on to a four-year college or university, they have the opportunity to graduate with the skills they need to be successful and set up for, for success. And so that's something I'm passionate about and will continue to work hard and fighting for. Um, but know that Lake County education, making it more student-centered and making sure that we can actually let teachers teach is something that I'm really passionate about, that my office doors are always open to the board members, superintendent, um, but most importantly, the members of this community that I represent. And I look forward to the continued dialogue and the upcoming session and what we can continue to do for our Lake County students. Thank you. Representative I can tell you on behalf of the board how appreciative we are for you and your work on this. Um, I know when I first came on the board four years ago, Mr. Mathias was standing behind the change in the, the FEFP formula and that him and I went to Tallahassee two years. I know that Dr. Burns has been this year, but this is the very first year that we've seen any traction. And I, I wholeheartedly, and I'm sure the board would, would agree with me that we attribute that to the work of Gray Robinson, of yourself of some of our other legislative delegates and of Mrs. Carnegie. So we truly, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you very much. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. All right, I think we are on our Student Advisory Council um, a Committee on Safety. Ladies, um, you guys would like to come up? How are we going to do that? So as they're coming, we do have some representatives here this evening from our Student Advisory Committee who have volunteered and brave souls who um, are going to come and speak on behalf of our students. Um, Mr. Weeks has their presentations. We'll give him a second. And as he's pulling that up, I'll just I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about this group. This was one of the board's priorities as we began to consider the new legislation in regards to school safety. Um, one of the things that they asked is we want to hear from students. And so I've asked for some volunteers from each of our high schools. And so this is a, a small representation of those students that um, have been coming to meet with myself along with staff to talk about some of the um, pieces of the legislation and how we might work together to, um, to actually execute these things within our classrooms. And so a little bit about how this happened. We did uh, start by reviewing the legislation and we talked about the three pieces that are entailed in the legislation that um, Mr. Dawson just mentioned. We talked about the dollars specifically available through grants for school hardening and what those dollars can be used for and what some of the priorities were for students in regards to school safety and their suggestions. We also looked at the dollars that were specifically um, allocated for mental health and what they felt like the needs were of students within the arena of mental health. And then lastly, we looked at the monies that were available for, for school resource officers. And as they narrowed it down and had that conversation, we all knew that putting a school resource officer, a deputy, in every one of our classrooms was certainly our first priority and something that we wanted to work towards, but we wanted to ensure that we did explore the other options as well, knowing that the cost of, to put a deputy in every school might be um, cost prohibited. So they, they really looked at the Guardian program and how that might be implemented and what students' feelings were on that. And I have to tell you, this was some of the most amazing group of students I've ever had the opportunity to work with. They're extremely bright, and they understood from day one that they were there to represent the voices of all the students and had to put their own personal opinions aside and really think about how do we get the information from all of the students. So what they decided to do was to create a survey. Um, they wrote all the questions themselves. They divided it up into three different groups. One group took the school hardening, one took mental health, and the other group took the Guardian program. And as a small group, they wrote their own questions. Um, and they developed the questions through a Google document. They became very proficient in the use of, of Google and uh, putting that survey together. And then they worked on strategies, how they would push that out at their schools. And so each of them took kind of different approaches and shared ideas um, in order to, s to actually solicit the input of their peers from the surveys. And then they met lastly to analyze the results and they put this presentation together all on their own. So what you'll see them share tonight is the, the summary of that presentation. So first, representing the group that addressed the matters of school hardening is Carielle Pearson, and she is a student from Lake Mineola High School, and she's going to share on behalf of her group. So I'll turn it over to Carielle. Okay. 
Um, I would just really quickly like to say thank you to our superintendent and to the board for giving students this opportunity to speak up about such an important matter. Because as students, we feel as though sometimes our voices aren't heard. So thank you guys for this opportunity tonight. So tonight I'm going to be talking about the school safety measures. And the graph that you see is we ask students to rank from one to seven what would make them feel safer in schools, one being very important and seventh being their lowest priority. And these are the options that they had to choose from. It was metal detectors and wands, cameras and radios, doors and locks, clear backpacks, fencing, active shooter training, and other. The first priority, 26% of surveyed students selected doors and locks as their first or second priority to increasing their safety. 20% of students selected active shooter training as their second priority. And 98% of surveyed students selected clear backpacks as their last priority to making them feel safe. <laughs> <laughs> Then we also ask students how safe do they feel in school, one being, not, one being very safe and five not being safe at all, and 22% of students felt unsafe at school, 40% of students felt indifferent, and 38% of students felt safe. The, re the recommendations we have for the school safety measures is reinforcing doors and locks, but we also wanted to find out from students what do they mean by doors and locks. Do they mean gate doors, entry doors, or classroom doors? Then we also wanted to talk to facilities department to find out their current plans. We also wanted to provide active shooter training for students and teachers, and we decided that we should not try to introduce clear backpacks as an option. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And next is Reagan Young, who you met a few minutes ago, one of our award recipients, along with Taylor Wood. These are both from Leesburg High School, and they are representing the group that um, discussed matters regarding mental health. So welcome. Thank you. Good evening. As Ms. Kronigay just said, my name is Reagan Young, and this is Taylor Woods, and we are representing Leesburg High School and all of our colleagues which are a part of this committee, and we'll be discussing mental health issues within public schools. So as you see on this graph, we ask students how many of them feel that they have an adult they can go to on campus for any type of problem or just to talk to. And when we asked if they were comfortable going to any teacher, 74.5% of students responded that there is an adult on campus that they do feel comfortable approaching, which is pretty good, but we'd like to raise that number a little bit more. Okay. <laughs> Based on our observations, we recommend that teachers should allow themselves to become more personable with students and allow themselves to have a greater bond with their students. For example, at Leesburg High School, we have an English teacher that majority of his students feel comfortable going to him for no matter what problem that they have, and we just believe that's a very important aspect to have, not just to teach, but to be able to connect with your students on all levels, because that's how you get the best learning environment. Student-teacher student relationships are significantly important. Hi, I stated earlier I am Taylor Woods and I am representing Leesburg High School and I'm going to continue to talk about mental health. When we asked students how important it was to have an on-site psychologist at their school, 80% of the students ranked, rated it a three below, stating that it was highly important to them to have an on-site psychologist. When we asked students how important it was to have mental health integrated into their curriculum, again, 80% of the students felt that it was highly important to have mental health integrated into the curriculum. These two questions alone tell us that students not only value the importance of mental health, but want it integrated into their schools and want to have access to factors that would contribute to improving their mental health. When we asked students if they would participate in mental health forms it provided, 54% of students stated that they would participate in the mental health form. This not only tells us that they want to know more about mental health, but they would willingly go to the mental health forms. As, reviewed, as we reviewed the statistical margin, we found a large difference in the opinions of males versus females that we felt it was important to address. Females seem to view mental health as a much larger issue of importance 
As all of the students who did not believe an all psycho psychologist was important, 74% were male. So when brainstorming on this topic of recommendations for mental health within the curriculum, with my colleagues, we, there are multiple observations we came up with for handling mental health, such as holding class assemblies. One thing that we all agreed on was that all public schools in Lake County should hold class assemblies, maybe separated by gender, maybe every semester. Just have an assembly for mental health so you know that the school is there for you, educating you about it, just so the student population can know and be more educated on the topic of mental health. Yet we believe that the most important recommendation is that integrating a mental health curriculum into the mandatory HOPE class the majority of freshmen take, we believe that we should integrate a mental health seminar within the HOPE class so every student gets that. Thank you. Hi, good evening. I'm Jeremy Rapolo, Mrs. Caitlin Vance, and we're representing Montero High School. And first off, I'd like to say Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out here. <laughs> I hope you all enjoyed your day. Um, all right, so next slide. Yeah. For a Guardian program, before we could even put that into discussion, we had to ask students whether or not they felt comfortable like approaching teachers on campus because it's all about the trust of the teachers and their security. Okay, as he said, my name is Katie Vance. Um, we're going to discuss, uh, just like the last representatives touched on, we have some sort of the same data represented in the graph. What you can see there is that more than average, student 61% to be exact, felt comfortable with having somebody on campus to approach, but we decided as a committee that that wasn't enough. That's not a big enough number. We feel that every student on campus should feel comfortable with approaching somebody, and I can assume that you agree with that. So what we did was we tried to we gathered the information, we sat down, we thought, okay, how do we do this? We can't just say it, we have to actually have an action. So what we thought is that, okay, we need to build stronger relationships with their teachers and students. Okay, so by doing this, this is how we're gonna do it. We create a culture of awareness that supports student needs, which will touch base on with the recommendations, but just kind of a sensitivity training, whether it's learning how to approach a student that may not be as approachable as us, or some stuff like that. This uh, next slide represents um, the Guardian program itself based on students' opinions. What it asked was, do you feel comfortable as a Lake County student participating in the Guardian program? Okay, if you need help reading pie charts, um, <laughs> it's obviously the students agreed that it should be implemented into the Lakes County school programs. And 65% is a huge number because the amount of yes responses doubled the amount of no responses. So students obviously feel that the security of this program would really benefit them. All right, so certain guidelines had to be put in place for this guardian program. And we asked students like the number of guardians that they believe is best suitable for their campus. As representative of the data that we gathered, you can see that 54% of students answering this question chose greater than five guardians, which means they want five, six, seven guardians on campus, which was more than average um, what the students selected. This next question asks specifically who should participate in the guardian program, which I thought was pretty important myself. So the question asks, how safe would you feel with the following as a guardian on campus? The topics were uh, veterans of armed forces and the ROTC instructors. Okay, according to the data, students felt that veterans of armed forces and ROTC uh, officers were more likely to be like benefit them in the program because they said that they felt they were really safe and they felt like they were the best people for the job. And then this uh, is more specific, like other uh, positions, like administration athletic, and an athletic director. <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> so, as I said, we needed actions instead of just discussing what this survey gathered. What we decided was 
Based on the survey results, students are in favor of Lake County Schools participating in the Guardian program. And with doing that, we should be focusing on the individual staff members that would participate in this program, whether it's from student comfortability levels or like touching on veterans, RDC instructors, possibly administration, maybe not athletic directors so much. <laughs> yeah, what she said. And, um, and basically, like, the most important thing we uh, recommended here is creating a culture of awareness, you know, that we're, like, put the students in a better, peaceful environment where they're fully trusting their teachers and they feel secure and at home at school. You know, not, not a jail, just, just, just a fun environment. I just want to say, just to close our presentation out, that we really appreciate this opportunity, like the other said, to get to voice our opinions and get to represent such a big culture like this. And we really think you guys should take this into consideration and move on with it. Thank you. You can see why I said it was such a joy to work with this group of students. They were um, fun, but they, they worked very hard. Our very first session, we had scheduled an hour and a half, and the hour and a half went by very quickly, and they said, we don't want to go yet. And so they stayed for another hour or so and just continued the work. And if there are other members of the committee, many of them have to work and were not able to be here tonight. If, if they would please stand, I think um, there might be a few others here. Um, Samantha's here, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We'll be continuing to meet as we continue to work on these pieces of legislation, certainly considering the input of the committee. We have um, district staff, and they mentioned meeting with facilities who is working on the grant now for the hardening measures. And we also have our student services department working on the mental health portion that we have to submit the plan to the state. And then we also will have um, whether or not we'll be participating in the Guardian or what other measures we'll be taking um, coming shortly as we still, as Mr. Dawson said, there's a lot more questions than answers coming out of Tallahassee with much of this as they continue to work on the rules development process. Um, until then, we, there's still a lot of unknowns, but we're going to continue moving forward and making some recommendations here very short in the very near future. So thank you for your presentation and for all your hard work. And I know some of you are seniors and going to be leaving the group, but others are, are not and will be returning to, to join us through the summer months as well as into next school year. So thank you, and thank you, Mr. Weeks, for all your help in putting the presentation together with them. Thank you. We are welcoming our student representative, Ashley Maybe from Mount Dora High School. I know your parents are very proud, and they're here, as well as your principal, who's sitting in the back, and we are looking forward to an update from Mount Dora High School. Okay. Good evening. I'd like to take some time to highlight a few great things that we've done here at Mount Dora High School. This year, Mount Dora High School followed the Lake County School District with the goal of making our high school a destination school. Our teachers have embraced the school-wide initiative of reading, writing, thinking, and speaking during every period, every day. All the seniors are looking forward to graduation, myself included. We recently had our senior breakfast, which was an amazing morning where we received our yearbooks, caps, and gowns, and we enjoyed a delicious breakfast made by our own culinary department. We also had Grad Bash at Universal Studios, which was just as much fun as all the seniors expected it to be. I'm proud to announce that our parents involved with Project Graduation have raised almost $10,000. I'd like to thank them for their dedication for that. And the senior work ceremony was great. We had a total of over $2.5 million in scholarships awarded, so I think that's pretty darn good. Um, yeah. At Mount Dora High School, we are looking forward to Mr. Sandy Gamble, our Lake County School Vice Chairman, and Dr. Creed Wheeler, our Lake County Chief of Technology, joining us this Friday at graduation. Our SGA all worked in tandem to arrange a memorial ceremony for all those lost and affected by the Parkland High School shooting. I would like to put a spotlight on Montara High School because we are the only high school to offer on-site dual enrollment, which is a great help for students unable to travel off campus for dual enrollment. We're partnered with uh, the Lake Sumter. Thank you. <laughs> um, Along with dual enrollment, we offer 13 AP courses on campus, which is a big hit with our students prepping for college. 
Our Air Force JROTC unit has, for the third time in four years, earned the highest level unit award, the Silver Star Community Service Award. This huge award, this is a huge accomplishment because only the top 5% of the 900 JROTC units worldwide may earn this prestigious award. Band has also had students awarded first place scholarships of $12,000 from the Villages Opera Club. I'm proud to highlight our athletics. Our boys soccer team won districts, and our girls soccer team and boys baseball team were uh, runners up for districts. We also have six uh, student athletes moving on to play their sport at the collegiate level. It's been a great year at Montara High School, and I would like to thank Chairman Luke, Superintendent Carnegie, and the other board members for allowing me to represent Montara High School tonight. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Ashley. Well done. You represented Mount Dora High School well. Now we are moving to Chelsea McCurdy, a UCF graduate. Very proud of her and her accomplishments here as Rookie Teacher of the Year from Lost Lake. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you all for having me this evening. Um, when? Oh, thank you. <laughs> My first board meeting, can you tell? <laughs> when I was first asked to speak tonight, I wasn't sure where to start. So I went to the experts who could make this report that much easier to write. So I went to our students and I asked them to tell me what is going on in your classroom and at school and what are you going to remember most about this school year. Fifth grader Skylar reported they've been multiplying decimals, dividing fractions, learning about important people of the past and the Holocaust. And when asked what she will remember most, she said the people, her friends, and her administration. Fourth grader Jasmine reported they've learned science, math, and reading. She stated they learned about rocks and minerals, and she will remember their field trip to CMEX the most because of all the scientific things they did. Third grader Maddie reported learning fractions, multiplication, division, and text structures. She will most remember the Sunday party they had for mastering their multiplication facts. Second grader Grace stated they made writing projects and they read chapter books. She will most remember going to recess and playing jump rope with her friends. First grader Nyla reported they've worked on math and reading, listening to their teacher, and doing partner work. She will remember that math is important because it tells you stuff for life. <laughs> Kindergartner Kyle stated they learned words, fairy tales, and followed directions. He will remember his teacher most because he learned so much. At the end of the day, we're here for the students. Sorry, that one always brings tears to my eyes. He's such a sweet kid. And I promise you I didn't pay him to say that. That was his words. Um, at the end of the day, we're here for the students. On top of the standards we teach them, they come to school to make a connection with us. And that's what we're here to do, to make those relationships and those connections with our students. So thank you. Well done, Chelsea. Very well done. Uh, Mr. Findlay, you are our um, school-related employee of the year finalist. I got to follow that. Yes, you do. <laughs> I, I want to assure you I'm not an athletic director. Uh, <laughs> this kind of, it, it popped up on my calendar, but um, going back to school some 30 years later, that's crazy, right? <laughs> Uh, I was a street cop working the streets and um, little little time frame difference there it, it took a while for me to get come to the SRD program but I did actually um, come to the school resource in April of last year so I had that two months at the end of the year of that experience so uh, but before I get thank you to the board you're awesome uh, thank you to Sheriff Cannell and Lake County Sheriff's Office uh, great agency I work for uh, my work wife, Sergeant Kelly Stone, who's the one that brought me over to school 30-something years later and said, come on. Um, sitting in the audience, my principal at uh, Tavares Middle School, lover to death, Ms. Trella Mott. Uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, and the administration and staff, but my utmost respect to you as educators, uh, wow. I, I thought I'd seen everything out on the streets and working it. Uh, I've got things on my phone I can't get rid of. Uh, I've got reports that I've done that have been wild and crazy. But going into this, I, it was an unknown for me. Um, again, being a cop and out there working the streets, you see a lot of silliness and, and things that you just can't grasp. And I didn't think that would be the case going into a middle school. But yeah, it is. Uh, <laughs> 
so I just kind of put my best foot forward and decided it wasn't just about going to work when I started there. Um, I didn't know what to do. Um, you know, I'm, I'm getting around kids that I haven't been around and, other than my own because, thank goodness, three of my boys are there, so they probably helped me too. They're all middle schoolers. Well, one going into high school this, year, this coming year. But um, I just decided to go to work, and in going to work, I decided to make it home, and, um, and I did that. Um, I just, the high fives, I hit my millionth mark for high five today, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, my lieutenant's in the crowd, so thank you to her as well. She she keeps me going as well. But uh, I'll be honest with you, it was a way different thing coming into it. I was just so worried I was going to do the wrong things. So I did everything I could to do the right things. And even Trell will tell you I talk too much. Um, so I'll make this as short as possible. But uh, I came into it and I said, okay, let's do something different. So I put together the Patriot Youth Court uh, with the assistance of some of our teachers. And we actually took from our sixth, seventh, and eighth grade and and through the APs and Ms. Smott, we selected those who would serve as uh, judges and bailiffs on the Patriot Youth Court. And I wrote the, the paperwork for it. And they, they followed the liberation process. And they deal with level one referrals, which has worked out real good in the, in the uh, peer to peer punishment. It's, I mean, it's nothing crazy. But uh, these judges uh, will uh, transfer, our sixth and seventh graders will transfer into the seventh and eighth grade capacity next year. And we'll, we'll find new sixth graders to fill that role. Uh, but they were astounded at the problems that we dealt with at, at the school level. They couldn't believe the drama. And I'm like, you live it with 1,147 students every day, and you can't believe it when you come into court. But um, so we put that I put that together, and, and I made it theirs. It's a Patriot thing now. It's not a, a Deputy Finley thing. And then, uh, Sandy, you were there, and I don't know who else got to participate uh, months ago. And it was a lot of work, but I put together First Responders Day um, at Tavares Middle School. Um, I started somewhere in October, November, getting the permissions, and then kind of, okay, I've never done this before. Now what do I do? <laughs> so um, I was lucky enough to actually fill the entire bus loop. Uh, the open grounds coming into the, the area. I had multiple hel helicopters there, uh, FBI, uh, ATF, uh, DEA, U.S. Marshals, Border Patrol, the entire Lake County Sheriff's Office, thank you to my agency, uh, and put on an actual First Responders Day that the kids could uh, actually see what we really are about as first responders. EMS came in, the fire department came in. So, um, I'm just looking forward to next year. I got eight days left, and then it's on to summertime for us. And um, I look forward to August 13th. So I'm looking forward to seeing the kids again because at the end of the day, they're the ones that made this for me. So it made it happen. So. We appreciate you, Mr. Finley. Nice job following up. Thank you. Um, Carmen Cullen for our Educational Foundation. I. Okay, we lost you. <laughs> Again? Again. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman, Board, and Superintendent. Um, the Educational Foundation Board had its uh, strategic planning retreat on April the 25th and established the following goals for 2018-2020. Increased support for programs with direct connections to improved educational outcomes for students to include CTE, early learning, et cetera intentionally align with current and emerging district strategic priorities, invest in improvements to organizational performance, improving internal systems, processes, skills, and capacity, shift fundraising through growth and individual donor cultivation, and begin building an endowment. Um, Apple Mart has had 686 teacher visits and distributed $51,450 worth of supplies. Um, a few months ago, the foundation stood up here and was proud to announce that we had been rated in the top 50 education foundations in the um, nation. We've just received the Consortium of Florida Education Foundations State of Our Members 2018 report, and it indicates that we were 19th in the state for FTE of 42,518, which is the benchmark of 19. We were 12th in the state for revenue at um, 1.9 million. We were eighth in the state for revenue raised per student at $46.77 per student. And we were 15th in the state for money raised per staff member at 265,000. So we were very proud um, to be ranked in the state. 
In the past 30 days, we have honored our school-related employees, volunteers of the year, our incoming Take Stock in Children class of 2022, our outgoing class of 2018, the top 3% of our graduating class at um, four events that were attended by over 1,050 supporters. We also had the Ladies for Education Golf Tournament, which raised scholarship funds. Tomorrow night, we will be hosting the dedication ceremony at Leesburg High School for the 2018 Florida State Teacher of the Year, Ms. Tammy Jerkins, at 5 o'clock. On Thursday, we will be hosting and honoring the Lake County School Retirees for the year 2018. We received word last week that we've received a grant in the amount of 31000 to start an aviation and aerospace program at Umatilla High School. We also received a $7,500 grant from Wells Fargo for Take Stock and Children's Scholarship funding. On June 13th, I will be attending the Commissioner's Business Recognition Awards as Commissioner Pam Stewart honors Lake County Schools Business Partner of the Year, which is Lake County Tourism and Development Council. In addition, she's going to be honoring um, Sumter County's um, Business Partner of the Year, which happens to be Lake County and Sumter County's Take Stock in Children. Um, so that'll be a double honor for us. Our next major event is Stepping Out for Education. Florida Counselor Specialist will be presenting two nights of ballroom competition on July 27th and 28th at Mission Inn. Our local celebrities include Casey Hobbs from United Southern Bank, Mike Randolph, our very own principal at Leesburg High School, Joyce Huey from 2O Hags, Frank Remsen, Esquire from Remsen Law Firm, Kirsten Nolan, Florida Counselor Specialist, and Chuck Hyatt from Besh Engineering. The next foundation board meeting will be at the district office on Wednesday, May 23rd, 2018. Any questions? Thank you very much, Carmen. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Johnson, nothing tonight? Okay. At this point in time, we are going to begin our public input. Um, just in a, in a manner to make it run more efficient, I'm going to call two people. So I'm going to call Courtney, Courtney Franklin. You're up first. And then Diana Alley Wilson, if you'll come to the opposite podium. And then I'll, I'll continue in that manner so that you guys have your opportunity to speak. Oh, Courtney, hold on one second. I'm sorry. Superintendent, I put that there. Y'all can come on up. And as you're coming, I have prepared an opening statement because I, I think I know why many of you are here this evening and so I'd like to make an opening comment. <laughs> so since the beginning of the 1718 school year, we've been very transparent about our financial picture and the fact that we have been teetering on a 3% uh, fund balance, which is the mandated um, fund balance for the state. In an effort to improve our financial position, we launched a financial recovery plan aimed at addressing three competing needs. Number one was to increase the fund balance back up to the 4% reserve as required in our district policy. Number two, to reduce the amount of capital transfers to address our much needed school facility issues and needs. And number three, to increase compensation for our employees. We worked really hard over this year to execute this recovery plan that included the elimination of some programs and other expenses, but with over 85% of the budget tied up in salaries for contracts that were already committed for the 1718 school year, we knew that it was going to take a year before we could reduce staff, freeing up additional dollars for future reoccurring costs. We did receive an additional $2.8 million from the state legislature that we can use to help restore our fund balance, but as we know, that's not a reoccurring um, revenue. In addition, this allocation cycle, we reduced approximately $5.2 million in school allocations and another $2 million in district office staff. Savings that we've set aside for compensation in preparation for the 18-19 budget, remembering that we have both instructional and non-instructional staff to consider. So to say that we don't want to increase compensation is not an accurate statement. But what we cannot do is erode our narrow fund balance and destabilize the operations of the district, an outcome that would hurt our students, parents, teachers, all district employees, and entire Lake County community. Financial stability takes time, and I know that you guys have been patient for a very long time. But we've accomplished a lot in a year, and we still have a lot of work ahead of us. 
So we must consider that we must re continue to repurpose resources. We have to continue to reduce costs, but just know that we are committed to increasing compensation for our employees beginning with the July, in July of 2018. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Courtney and her comments. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, um, first, thank you for having us, as always. Um, this, I come to school, you guys know me, I'm a school board regular, I'm a school board junkie, but this is so fantastic. And you have to see, you have to be sitting there thinking, I wish I could give them the world. I wish that I could make them all millionaires. The way all this positivity, be, the teachers doing a great job teaching, the students doing a great job learning, even the politicians helping, shocking. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there, we, there has been, and I've been here long enough to know that it's, our beef is not only not with the school board per se, but with the state of Florida and the way that they allocate the money. So that is fantastic that I see the, the Tallahassee, the politicians in Tallahassee trying to make some good changes in the right direction. And I know that you guys, just like a superintendent just said, I know that would, if you could, you would give it to us. But I have to tell you, I'm very worried. I'm worried about these teachers and I'm worried about what will come of Lake County if we don't turn it around. And I know that you're doing everything you can to turn it around, but I've been coming to school board meetings, like I said, for better than a decade. And I can honestly say I've never had more faith in a superintendent and a school board than I do in this one. That being said, and I know about your challenges too, that former administrations have left you and former school board members have left you and budget allocations have left you. I understand all of that, but I think that you, now, it, it, we're, time is of the essence with some of these teachers. They're at the end of their ropes and there's not much more that they can do. There's not much longer they can hang on. So we're going to have to. What I, what I want you to hear, and I'm sure you're gonna hear it over and over and over, is how hard they work and you know that. And I know, like I said, that you would give them the raise if you could, but I think that that needs to be the top priority because all these great things are going to come to the students of Lake County but without the teachers to teach those students we're going to have a bigger problem thank you thank you Courtney Joel Mesha Joel Mesha Melsha thank you all right Diana Good evening, thank you for the opportunity, Madam Superintendent and school board members. My name is Diana Ali Wilson. I have been a kindergarten teacher at Pine Ridge Elementary since the school opened in 2003. That being said, that this year will be the third time in 15 years that I have not been given a pay increase. That is unacceptable. It is unacceptable for every single teacher in this room. That means every five years, Lake County does not, is not able to manage its funds properly to give their teachers their compensation. I have shown up every single day for work. I have done extraordinary things with my classroom and for the board to imply that because I do not attend a school board meeting that I do not care is appalling. I did not attend my cancer survivor group this evening so that I could be here. I brought this apple because last week one of my students gave it to me. This is probably an apple that that student was had for snack that day and probably all that that family could afford to give her. You'll notice there's some bruises on this apple, but inside this apple, it is perfectly good to eat. I brought this apple because that's what my student gave me. Unlike what my school board gave me was a rotten apple on, during Teacher Appreciation Week when you took all year to let us know that there was no money. That is unacceptable. As a teacher, I showed up with good faith that you would do your part. I showed up and did amazing things in my classroom. I have not seen any school board members peeking through my windows in my classroom or coming in does that mean that you don't care about my classroom since you have not shown up to Pine Ridge to see me? Because that works both ways. It is appalling to me. It is appalling. 
I am a parent of a kindergartner in Lake County Schools. We have seriously considered sending him to a different county because I fear for what kind of a teacher will want to come and teach in Lake County. Why would you come teach here? Madam Superintendent, I appreciate all of your efforts and your hard work. But when you applied for this job, Madam Superintendent, if the board had stated to you, we can't offer you that much money, but we could give you some iced tea. I can't call Wells Fargo and say, I'm terribly sorry, I'm not able to make my mortgage payment, but here's some tea. Thank you, Ms. Allen. We expect you to do better, Thank and you. you can. Thank you. Lisa Rowe. Lisa Rowe. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, Madam Chairwoman and Superintendent Cornegay, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. Um, I've been asked to read a statement on the behalf of my friend and colleague, Tabitha Zangri, who was recognized tonight. She was not able to be here because, unfortunately, her car broke down and she had to dedicate her time to getting transportation so that she can be at work tomorrow. I want to say before I read her statement that Tabitha is one of the most gifted young teachers I've ever worked with. She's amazing what she does for our students. They love her. She has a wonderful personality. They flock to her for advice, for information, and for, for knowledge. And I'm just going to read her statement, and you'll understand why I'm so upset. This is the third year in which I have been recognized by the Florida Department of Education as a high-impact teacher, but the first time which I have been invited here to be congratulated. For that, I thank you. While I appreciate the gesture, it does not make up for the fact that we are ending the school year without a contract. I have been rated high impact, highly effective for three consecutive years, yet I make about $500 more a year than the first year teacher next door to me that has needed my daily support. Performance pay is a lie when it does not pay teachers for their performance. This is one of the reasons why I will be not be returning to Lake County Schools next year. While I realize that many problems are statewide, Lake County must figure out a way to pay teachers fairly if it is going to be a destination district. I am relocating my family to teach in New York for the remainder of my career. If Florida does not begin to treat teachers fairly, good teachers will continue to leave. Yes. <laughs> I thank you for your time, and I know that you will continue to work on a solution to these problems that we have inherited. Thank you. Thank you. John Napolis. John Napolis. Napolis. Got it. Okay. Ms. Rowe. Right. Good evening. My name is Lisa Rowe. I'm not only a teacher, but a product of our Lake County school system. Upon graduating from Tavares High School, I pursued my college education through Lake Sumter State College and then on to Indiana University. Upon graduation, I moved back to Florida to teach in the community in which I grew up in. I have been a teacher for Lake County for 28 years now. During this time, I have seen our school system survive times of prosperity as well as times of famine. Even though, even through the times of famine and no form of pay raise or step to be held to help meet increase of living costs, I've continued to stay by your side. Now, I get to experience yet another moment in time where funds have, have been spent and mismanaged, leaving nothing to support those who have the most invested, our teachers. I have been impressed with our new leadership and feel that our school system's best interest is at heart. I appreciate the honesty and openness of the dialogue that has taken place. I understand you can't make something out of nothing at this point in time and need to recoup lost funds and reestablish balanced spending. What I ask is that as you move forward, you develop a stronger stance on how you're going to right the wrongs that have been made and prove that Lake County schools really want to invest in quality teaching and support long-term instructors. As you know, 
and research shows that when we deal with high turnover rate, we lose our in-student progress. It takes an average of three years to develop a strong, highly effective teacher who is a true master of their craft. There is much for a new teacher to learn from school processes and procedures to student management and programs to curriculum and progress monitoring. Each time a teacher quits, we start at square one again. What is even more unique is how new inexperienced teachers are earning as much as some and sometimes more than our veteran teachers. What's wrong with that picture? How do you retain those highly effective veteran teachers when they cannot climb the ranks in an appropriate manner without being ran over? As a teacher, I should not have to fight for what I have earned. As a 28-year as a teacher with a master's degree and evaluation of highly effective, I should not still be receiving ads and information on how I qualify for subsidized government housing. You know, <laughs> something's wrong with that. All I ask is, as you recognize our failed budget and develop stronger resources, that you choose to invest strongly in what is truly going to get our system going strong, our teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bell. <laughs> Christy Allen. Christy Allen. Okay, Mr. Napolis. Thank you. Hey, how you doing? Um, John, uh, anyways, like a lot of people, I want to give you guys the benefit of the doubt. But with our pay going downward and your pay going upward, it starts polarizing two directions, which leaves us with fewer options. The two options that come is corruption or incompetence. So with the county having the 10.3 possible audit, sucking all the money out of the kids, where's the kids at? Their money. There's no chance really on the horizon of much. And I guess the question is, what is being done really? We talked about it at the school. We said, what do you guys think we should do? It's really management's job to manage. So the question really is, again, like, uh, and, and I'm not coming off the offensive. You are real pleasant when you came to the school. I get that face to face. You know, you too. But the thing is, at the end of the day, I mean, you too. I think you came out for a grant one time. We shot it for a while. That's fine. As people, I have nothing against you, but this is business. What are you doing to solve the question? Because the thing is, it's, it's just running up the clock. There's no real solutions. And it's not our job to come up with the solutions. It's our job to do what we're supposed to do. And I like for the kids here, as I watch the kids up here, the main thing I thought about is, I want you guys to get used to the dog and pony show of life. Those of you got 500 bucks and 1,000 bucks, that's nothing compared to what you should have been getting all throughout middle school, high school, because if, if the money is not managed correctly, we are never going to get what we want. And honestly, you never will get what you want because you need us and the parents to stay doing your job. And it's coming. And it's not meant as an attack. It's, again, it's not personal, but this is business. You know, I want you to have what you want to have, but you have got to meet us somewhere in the middle. It really is coming to that. I mean, truthfully, it, I mean, we're all open, but you got to have... You know what I mean? Like, and also, the tea thing, you meant well, but maybe think about it. It's kind of offensive. Also, don't cancel school on the last day without checking with the principals. Maybe they had retirement parties that cost money. These are, you got three people in the districts. You got more people. You should be able to pick up the phone or email the principals. It's just, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how things work. That's all. I'm wondering Thank how things you. work. Thank you. Shelly Mora. Shelly Mora. Okay, Ms. Allen. Hi. Um, thank you, school board and superintendent, for having me here. Um, despite teaching 140 teenagers a day, I am terrified of public speaking, so you'll have to excuse me a little bit here. I'll try not to repeat what other people have already said. We already know there's a pay problem. I don't have to explain that to you. You know it's there. Instead, I really just want to tell you um, uh, one story, my story, and it's just one of many, and it's many of the same conversations I'm hearing throughout multiple schools with multiple teachers of, okay, we got our contract offer, and it wasn't great, so now what? Because we gave it to you guys and said, fix it, and you came back and said, no, and so what can we then do? And these are the options that I came up with and that others have come up with. I could switch counties. Marion County is 30 minutes down the road from me. I could teach at Lake Bear Middle School. Just by moving districts 30 minutes away, I would get a $2,000 pay raise. 
Unfortunately, it's not an option for me. I'm an expectant mother. That would be a discontinued service um, for one year. I would be ineligible for my maternity leave coming next year, so I can't do that one. Another option I could do, one that was suggested um, by the district, would I could potentially quit and reapply for my job because that would put me on the new higher pay scale. However, that also comes with a break in pay, and I am the primary earner in my family. It also means a break in my benefits, which includes mine, my children, and my baby's medical insurance, which takes care of both my children and my prenatal care. We could strike, but as we all know, in the state of Florida, as a public employee, we cannot strike. Um, if we were to do that, I would risk losing my employment and my teaching certification. And then when I put some of this out into the great public community, um, lots of very intelligent people told me, well, I should just quit my career and start something else. Um, but that would mean abandoning my students. It would mean abandoning the 10 years I've already put into my own education and my own sacrifices I had made just to start this career. And that honestly is the worst option I could think of. And so when it comes down to it, what would you recommend for me? Should I risk my health, my children and my baby's health, my certification or my career? Because those are the options that I'm left with. And then I realize that I'm backed into a corner. And the only option I have is to accept what you give me and to allow myself and my profession to be disrespected and paid unfairly, and I'm not alone. There are hundreds of other teachers, good, inspiring, motivating teachers who are having these same conversations, teachers who taught me when I was in school. And they're talking about how they're too old to go back to school and they're too tired to fight. And you call it a destination district. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Sarah Seabree. Sarah Seabree. All right, Ms. Mora. Good evening. My name is Shelly Mora. I moved to Lake County about 16 years ago. And during that time, my son has gone through Lake County Public Schools, and my daughter's entering middle school next year. And during that time, I've had the um, pleasure of working with four different elementary schools of teachers who've educated my children, nurtured my children, and prepared them to be successful. And let me tell you, we have amazing teachers in Lake County. And during that time, I became one of them. And, <coughs> excuse me, and in my 13 years in Lake County, I've done everything I can to be successful for my students, for my school, and for my county. I've received my master's in education degree. I'm a highly achieving teacher. I give my nights and I give my weekends to my students, <coughs> to my school, and to Lake County. I give 200%, and I ask in return, what do I get? Yes, I get a paycheck, and it pays my bills if I want to walk to work and live on ramen noodles. Okay? <laughs> but you know, my standards are a little bit higher than that, and for my 13 years of being a teacher in Lake County, I've had to have a second job. And let me... And let me tell you, working two jobs is very rough, okay? I only have four days off a month, four days with my family, okay? And most of that time, it's grading papers. Yeah. And it's getting, as I'm getting older, it's getting harder to work that much, okay? And pretty soon, I know I won't be able to do that, and I'm going to have to choose. I'm going to have to, and that's where you guys come in. You guys are going to make that decision for me, because either one, I'm going to stick with a career that I love, that I'm successful at, or the career, the job, that pays my bills. And it's sad to say, but as a server, I get paid more money than what Lake County pays me. And sadly, I'm afraid that I'll be one more of those teachers, a good teacher who leaves this career. Because I work for a school board who decides to give teachers a 0% pay increase. You guys all have the power to change that. If not, there's gonna be many of us that'll be leaving as well. Thank you. Stuart Klatt, Ms. Seabree. Good evening. I'm so sorry, Ms. Seabree. I'm so sorry. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Seabree. I work at Umatilla Elementary School. When creating a slogan, you look at the demographics. You think about the pitch. 
what is going to catch the attention of the buyer, the viewer, the supporter. When creating a slogan for the Lake County Schools, these things need to be considered. Calling this place Destination Lake could be anything more but deceiving right now. Destination is a word with meaning. Vacations, dreams, sunsets, coffee on the porch, walks by the lakes. While all of these things sound great for destination, they truly don't sound like our, count, our current situation at Lake County Schools. It was my dream to become a teacher where I grew up. That dream has become a reality for the last 17 years of my life. Has this been my final destination, dream destination? Hardly not. Let's start with working environment. Does the air condition work? Mm, sometimes. <laughs> Do we have clean floors? Maybe, if we have enough janitors. Is it dust free? Mm, not quite. Do we have leaking tiles? Mm, yeah, lots of them. Professional environment. Meetings during planning, evaluation systems that drop the morale instead of raise it, teaching, disciplining instead of teaching. Too many new ideas all in one year. This is what happens in a classroom. Let's talk about our salary. It's a schedule that requires some kind of special degree to interpret, allows us to qualify for special services from the government, financial services that if single moms can qualify for, single teachers can qualify for too. To survive, some must have two jobs after school hours. Reality across the board, I know you agree with us. This is all unfair. What do we do? Come spend a day with us. Give us your time, actually your time. Don't evaluate us, don't judge us, just observe us and see what we do. Then sit down with us. Then see that this truly is not a destination lake. Refine the word destination lake so that people can have job security. What is job security? Having a job knowing that I'm here year to year. Being able to buy a house in this destination lake. Start a life, a family for those. Keep this one mind, planned with the end in mind. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Ms. Smith, next. Mr. Clapp. Hi, I'm Stuart Clapp, president of LCEA. Um, let's hear it for the teachers. Um, I just got a couple observations. First off, the students were talking about how important mental health counseling is, counselors. Yet counselors are one of those job classifications that we exclude from bonuses, both the state and even the district through the LIFT program. Okay, now, the LCEA banquet was last week. I need to thank Ms. Cornegie and Mark Dodd for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs> teachers, appreciate, teachers appreciate the support. We got to pass out about $7,000 in, in scholarships. So it was a very nice evening. Now, just a tip. When a principal tells a teacher that they're doing away with their position due to allocation cuts, then when the teacher sees that same position advertised, it apparently wasn't really cut. <laughs> Just an observation. Now, another observation. We do know that uh, House Bill 7069 says that contracts cannot do annual contract retention. The great thing is we don't have a new contract yet. That bill doesn't go into effect until July 1, and it even says as long as you haven't renegotiated your contract, your contract stays. So therefore, <laughs> therefore in somebody's interpretation, overzealousness, we have laid off teachers, told them annual contract, we don't have to hire you back, even though they had a highly effective rating or four years of effective rating, that the contract says, we guarantee you get reappointed. Now, I've asked that question to several administrators asking for clarification and have gotten none. 
So I went and to outside attorneys and outside legislative people and said, no, your contract stays until it's ratified. Then uh, Bill 7069 kicks in. So that's another observation. Um, when I've got another observation. I'm on a roll. Um, I passed out. I passed out working conditions, uh, comparison of Lake County to other counties. The last one I wanted to bring up, and it's very quick. We do require teachers to go to graduations. The weather this week is going to be horrible. So if it gets canceled on Friday night, required, and the principal says, well, you have to come back Saturday morning, required, and then that gets rained out, how many required evenings does this person have to give? Just another question. If you have any questions over the information I gave you, feel free to give me a call. And thank you all very much for attending. Thank you. Kim Harrison. Kim Harrison. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Good evening. I'm Kathy Smith, Vice President of LCEA. And I'm here speaking on behalf of another teacher who could not be here tonight. But she says, good evening, Dr. Carnegie, board members, and my amazing Mount Dora High School family. I have the privilege of working with some of the best and brightest administrators, teachers, and students in the county. I wish I could say I'm simply here to support my school. Sadly, instead, I am here with grave concerns about the integrity of a recent salary proposal made to the teachers in this district, and one that I am seriously thinking of resigning. First, let me say that I have no desire to line my pockets with the lift funds that you redistributed mostly from my Title I colleagues in Proposal 2. Those are my peers who work tirelessly with the poorest and most challenging of our student body. I still firmly believe this district is too top heavy and the funding can be found elsewhere. What amount monies from such taxpayer fund fully funded trips to out of county workshops, cell phones provided to district administrators, our software programs such as $975,000 video playlist organizer in which teachers could be trained to do virtually the same thing using YouTube, and item number 10.02, the Achieve contract over $250,000 and not been peer reviewed. As you know, close to half of the instructors in the district are on a grandfather salary schedule. Many of us hold a master's degree in our content area and have earned highly effective and high impact standings, exceeding both district and state expectations. Many of us are the best and brightest, yet we are paid less than teachers with little experience who came into the district on annual contracts. So you can understand our relief when we received a February email stating, and I quote, I will work tirelessly to ensure that every employee feels valued and appreciated, and I know that means fixing compensation. Our relief was short-lived. The proposals we received in no way, shape, or form address the discrepancies between grandfathered and annual employees, and it is my contention, my contention that they are discriminatory in nature. Additionally, we are continually told that the issue is with the state approving the plan and not this district. I am not an attorney, but I can read. Statute 1012.22 clearly states that the district provides differentiated pay for instructional personnel based on district term determined factors, yet these must be approved by the state. But I looked at several surrounding districts, including Seminole, Osceola, Orange, Flagler, and Clay. None of them offer their highly effective grandfather teachers less than their effective annual contract teachers. Not one. Yet they have been approved by the state. In fact, I would venture to say that Lake is in violation of these statutes. Uh, let us know you plan on truly showing your appreciation for experienced, highly effective instructors whose passion for teaching shows in the success of our students. Right now, we're still waiting. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Eileen Carroll. Eileen Carroll. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. 
Good evening, my name is Kim Harrison and I'm a resident and teacher in Lake County. This is my 23rd year teaching and 13th year in Lake County. I'm one of the lucky teachers to have the opportunity to open Lake Mineola seven years ago. Working at Lake Mineola and having Miss Shepard, aka Mama Hawk, as my principal has been an amazing experience. During my teaching career, I have had nothing but great principals. However, Miss Shepard is in a league all her own. She sincerely cares about each and every one of us and will always have time to listen to us and help us out in any way possible. During Teacher Appreciation Week, she made the whole staff feel like royalty, not only providing food for all of us every day, but also serving us. She makes us feel appreciated every single day. On the other hand, what did the county do to appreciate teachers last week? You may have had good intentions, but your offers came across as insulting and a slap in the face to most. After two days of the rhyming, many just deleted the emails without ever reading them. The last day of post-planning being off is actually a nice gesture. However, you had to wrap it around the active shooter course that needed to be completed. The icing on the cake is when we found out during Teacher Appreciation Week that we would not be receiving a raise. Teachers all over this county combined their efforts to raise their school score, and at Lake Mineola, we went from a C to a B. For all our efforts too long to list here, we received an offer of zero for raises. What is the message the county is wanting us to see? Lake County would never be considered a destination spot as long as it continues to treat teachers this way. You are now and in the future going to lose great teachers that are either leaving the profession or moving to another county where they can receive more pay now and expect pay increases in the future and where other neighboring counties have a highly effective rating in the 80% range, unlike Lake County where only 28% earn this distinction. You also need to find a solution to the pay inequities of veteran teachers like myself who should be making $5,404 more a year but would need to give up my continuing contract to get this additional money. Wake up, Lake, and do what is right before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. Julie Bush. Thank you, Ms. Carroll. Good evening. Um, it has been brought to my attention that there's an assumption that my attendance at the board meetings and the bargaining meetings somehow indicates that I am satisfied with our current lack of contract and financial compensation, and I want to correct that opinion. Um, my union representatives sit at those meetings and bargain in good faith for my contractual rights and interest in the same way that I expect my city, county, and state representatives to represent me in their job responsibilities. I've not attended these meetings because after I've spent nine to 10 hours at school each day, I feel that I also have an obligation to my family. In addition, I've spent almost every Friday evening through Sunday evening in Lakeland caring for my mother with stage four lymphoma since September. So I wanna make it abundantly clear that I do not enjoy working without a contract again this year as I have several times in the course of my tenure in this county. Um, and I don't appreciate that every proposal brought to the bargaining table by my representatives seems to be met with silence or a no response, uh, nor do I consider that to be bargaining in good faith. I do not think that it is fair that we have not received our performance pay based on last year's evaluation since that is the contract that we are currently working under. In short, I am very disappointed that I have repeatedly been asked during the 28 years that I've been employed with this district to give the board time to adjust the rights of the wrongs of the previous administration. And the promises just ring hollow. And the bottom line is here we are again with nothing to show for our trust and patience in the process. I love teaching, I love my students, and I love learning, but I don't love the confrontation of having to defend myself for something that I feel I deserve. And I'm just tired of the promises where we're told one thing and the actions don't back it up. We're told to make lemons with lemonade. I don't know, I don't know where you're gonna pull it from, I don't believe for a moment that you're not trying, but it just feels like something's got to give and I personally am tired of it being me.
Bush. Hi, I'm Julie Bush. I've been a teacher for about seven years. Um, I work at Hill Elementary School, um, and I'm not a public speaker at all. I My voice is going to sound very funny. Um, I went back to college in my 30s. It uh, was not easy, a lot of late nights, especially with two small children to raise, but I did it. I graduated with my degree in education, and I started teaching. I started this journey, and I love what I do. It's not a career. It's a calling. I truly love it from the bottom of my heart. I love it. Um, all that hard work now, it seems like it was for nothing. I have no job security as an annual contract teacher. Um, I wanted to read to you the definition of expendable, of little significance when compared to an overall purpose, and therefore able to be abandoned, dispensable, replaceable, non-essential, um, unneeded. You've stated on several occasions that you want this district to be a destination location. Um, it's even mentioned on the website. Um, but I'm going to ask you, what makes that so? Why would anybody want to come here when there's no job security? There's nothing. I have nothing. I have a mortgage. And, and I have nothing. And I'm a product of Lake County Schools. I love this place. It's my home. My children went to Lake County Schools. I'm an asset to your county. I'm an asset to the classroom. I want you to think I'm an asset too. So please change this policy. It doesn't breed excellent. It's just promoting mediocrity and, and it just needs to change. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bush. I have five more public comment cards in regards to the Montessori um, charter application. So I've held those aside to when we get to that opportunity and discussion, so you guys know. Okay, at this point in time, I believe, Superintendent, we are at our consent agenda. Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Yes. Can yes. We do sir. a five minute break. Yes. Okay, we're going to have a five minute recess. Okay, we're going to go ahead and call the meeting back to order. Um, I believe we are on our consent agenda item. Um, Superintendent, if you have a recommendation. I would like to recommend approval of consent agenda items 8.01 to 8.06 and 8.09 to 10.27. Okay, you've heard the recommendation. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Nope. Thank you very much. I believe we will start on 8.07. And I can't remember if it's Mr. Gamble or, okay, Mr. Mathias. No, I'm 8.08. Huh? You're 8.08. I'm 8. You're 7. Oh, I'm 7. Yeah. Over right, it's 8.07, 8.08, <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, have it right there, 8.07. 8.07. So, board members, we, we, um, we have an opportunity, and the contract was in the, um, our board docs for the construction management. I will tell you that I spent an an awful lot of time going through it and benchmarking um, for a $4 million project. I usually I used all states when they did a $15 million project for us, and they threw much the same level, labor numbers um, at that project as this firm, CPPI, is. Um, and there's some seven, seven different management type people. We're paying for gasoline for all of them to come back and forth into Lake County. Um, we've got a cell phone, providing cell phones that average about $115 a month. They need to be talking, buying Booster, AT&T or something. Um, all in all, it's about uh, $85,000 worth of what I think is fat that the district, in, in what they call overhead, which is, du which is due. But, but they genuinely, in my opinion, are throwing a gorilla at a monkey project with so much executive type leadership. Um, on the small cafeteria remodel. And we'd be better served to reject this and go to someone who may have a more reasonable labor number, and I will not be voting for this. Who, um, who did the RFP on this? Like, oh, oh, let, me, let me rephrase. Was this RFP done recently with like our new policies in place? No. 
that concerns me. Well, the, the other thing, as Mr. Mathias pointed out, there's a lot of management in this. And to me, there, that it's just overwhelmed with a lot of high price management overseeing a small project of this nature here. If we were building a whole brand new school, it might be a little different, but just seeing just a cafeteria. The other thing is we're responsible for the bottom line, it comes back to us. We're responsible for the, the money that we proceed to go for further with this. And I've really not liked this project from day one a year ago when it was brought to us originally. Uh, because to me, I don't feel like we're using the facilities there to the best of our ability to build what we need to build as a right build versus just build something. Is this the two-story, you wanted it to be two-story? I, I feel that if we're going to do anything, it needs to be two-story on any, on any campus that we build on. But this is not feasible at this time to do this because we don't have the money to do it. Well, I, I'm not sure how deep we wanted to get in discussion on this one, but I think there, the two-story had a lot of issues with that. The number of classrooms we'd be able to add to that space once we put in stairwells and so on and so forth ended up being a million dollars a classroom. The state would never approve that kind of. No, it's not that much. It was that, but it was cost per student station would be per huge. Student station that was significant. But when you go into the second story of a cafeteria, well, well you, you wouldn't you, build it on top of the cafeteria. You, you build it. Not I'll on get the into the part, construction. You build it in the cafeteria. <laughs> Stay with us a second. We've got roughly two hundred seventy-seven thousand dollars worth of labor. That's all I want to speak about right now, and that we have an opportunity. We have, in the way that the construction management process works, is there were three firms that were chosen that we could reject this one and move right into the second negotiation. Is that right, Mr. Johnson? Yes. Okay. So, so. I mean, essentially, you've negotiated with the first gr group. You're unhappy with some of the items that still remain unnegotiable. Right. You're allowed then to go into the next group, but obviously, if you select and them, you will need to negotiate something better than you've got right now. Correct. That's the would be the intent. I, I also would like to say that this is not disparaging of CPPI because I know that our team went back and, and in good faith they did try to negotiate with us. It's just this they've just got such an overhead, and when you look at what they are throwing at this project, I would not I would venture to say that there's at least one hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of additional labor. I just added up just the gasoline alone that we're paying for an out-of-town company to come that they're charging us is some $14,000, $14,900. Uh, we're going to buy computer access at some $5,600. And um, I don't know, it's just on and on. And that's what big companies do is they spread out their, their overhead over multiple projects. And unfortunately, on a smaller project, it bears the blunt of it. It becomes so screaming at you where if it was a $60 million project, it would be buried and would not be as significant. That's all I'm saying. So what would be the time delay would be my question in regards to if we reject this recommendation to go with a second bidder, then how fast of a time can we get that negotiated contract back? That'd be you, John. Come on up, Mr. Carr, if you don't is that, mind. Is that John or Brick you're with? What? It's John. Yeah. Well, based on your decision, if it's, if it's rejected tonight, um, then we can go forth tomorrow and contact the, the the second party um, and and begin those uh, begin that contact tomorrow and try to set dates up for negotiations ASAP and but as far as reaching the resolve yeah. and bring it to the board I, I can't speak to that so you know that's as my friend says you know Karen it's, it's I don't have a crystal ball so you know we'll, we'll just have to negotiate and 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 do our best we can with on the timeline and be as expeditious as possible so I can only commit to the board that I will put 100% to push it forward as fast as I can, but I cannot speak for someone else's time or, or the manner in which we will proceed. But wouldn't the wouldn't the second choice already have bid higher? Like we almost all of our our old processes all based on no, in, in construction management they didn't bid at all. Right. They were picked on who is the prettiest. And, and prettiest. That's what do you mean by that? Who gives the best presentation? And, and it has nothing to do with price. Right. And now we're at the table with, we picked the prettiest, and now then they give us the price. And so it's incumbent on us to review it. And if we, if we don't think that it's fair, which I don't, that then we go to number two. And then ultimately you may end up with somebody ugly like me, and that may, we have the three choices. And if the, and again, the downside of it is if we go to door number two, or the next candidate, and they're higher, 
you can't come back to number one. Right. That's the risk you pay, and that's and so that's the risk that the, the peril that we're at. But we could go to number three. Is that correct? We then go to number three. Right. And but, and. But the time why, concerning. Why, was, why, why would we put right. on our like request for a proposal without monetary costs? That's that's how that's just how this construction management works. Is it? That's a whole other conversation. So help, Mr. Dodd, me, yeah. help me understand the, the process here. Okay, so if we reject this one and we go to number two, and you're saying we can't go back to number one, so then we have to go to number three, and there's no guarantee that two or three will be cheaper. Right. So then how does this process work? We have to begin the entire process all over again. Is that correct? But through all three, and you're not able to reach a deal with, then you'll but, have to start but I, over. I genuinely believe with all of my heart that if we move into two and three, that, that um, I don't even know. I don't know who two or three is, but so have, have we bench this, benchmarked this project against other districts? Because this is not no, just no, a no, cafetorium, but it's got some lab space in it. We're talking a parking lot as well. So uh, I, I think all those variables might confuse us a little bit. I, I just want to know what is what are other districts paying for a similar project? And if they're paying more than four million dollars, or if they're paying four million dollars, then we know that the benchmarking on it for me is more. Mr. Matthias, Mr. Matthias, can you use your microphone? Oh, sorry. Thank you. No, <laughs> <laughs> is I looked at what is the going uh, markup, and they're in line there, the CPPI. Then I started looking at then where we are we with the overhead, and and there's some pre-construction cost that's like twenty three thousand dollars, and by as a percentage of cost they were in line they were like half a point off on that, no big deal. Where it really became goofy was in then their general conditions or their expenses, and that's where it was wacky for me. And so when I came back, to me, benchmarking would have been $100,000 cut. And they found a mistake in the math, actually, which was about 60 to the 79. So they had a bit to go, and they came off like 12. And I'm just saying no. And, and the problem for me is, is that as we look at this project, and if we look, I just, for me, it's just, it's a, a thorn in, in my craw that we're paying gasoline for somebody to come in out of town when we have a general contractor that's two blocks away. That's just a thorn for me. And so that was the, the numbers that I added up that I was not going to pay for gasoline, I'm not going to pay $115 for a telephone, and I'm not going to pay for computer access to the tune of $2,400 for one of the guys. I mean, I'm just that's not a relationship that in my mind is healthy, that when these are the people that ultimately we're going to work with to save us money. And, and, I, and I don't want it personal because, again, I understand the size of that company and how they spread their cost, where a smaller construction manager on this size project is the right choice. That's all. I don't know why it sounds to me like I, I'm willing to take the chance in regards to the overhead and the management and the contract <laughs> negotiations that we have in good faith with our, our staff that understands those constraints. And the time constraint, I mean, I know that's a big deal for all of us sitting up here that we've been talking about this project now for a while. And so the... the More than a decade. Right. So for the, the possibility that it could get further delayed, I think that is on everybody's mind. Um, but as we've t heard tonight, if right. we that, in my mind, $100,000, what I think is fat, then right. we would be terrible stewards not, uh, right. not to look at this. Of every money, of every bit, every dollar. Right. Dr. Burns, you look like you have a question. I don't get why why the RFP went out without a money. I just don't get that. They are not requests for no, they're not bids. It is a request for qualifications. The idea is you the initial step in the process is to find out what builders are qualified to build it. They have the financial ability, the number of people available, the background, the history, all of those things and then you get three you pick three of those in that process. And after you've nominated your one, two, and three, then you go to number one and say, we want to negotiate with you for it. If you can't work it out, then you go to number two. Is there, is there a legal mechanism that we could do some RFQ or RF another letter um, that... <laughs> that you, could, it, you could do everything by straight bid, but you wouldn't get any construction manager jobs. It, so it originally was done as a hard bid, and it was... Um, it was so bizarre to me because it, it all you, you need to be a Tallahassee on this one. This is big. So under construction management, we it, it was a four million dollar budget or something, and it came in at or no, it was three million came in at four, but we couldn't work with that general contractor that was the low bid to get the, to value it, 
we had to throw everything out. That was bizarre. That's the hard bit scenario. Right. In the construction management scenario, this person, once, once, he, once we agree to his overhead, his profit, and that business, then he supposedly is going to negotiate it based on a guaranteed maximum price to bring the project in on budget. That's the theory. In my opinion, and I was just with another group the other day where we were speaking about construction management, that they should be in on the design phase, that we are, we're picking them backwards, if you really want to Yeah, it seems yeah. completely backwards. So that's something for us to speak about as we're moving for to some procurement changes. But tonight, tonight is we're talking about this particular deal, and we have an opportunity to move to number two, and, and I would ask that we do that. Thanks. Anybody else, board members? Okay, Superintendent, your recommendation. I recommend approval of 8.07, the construction manager for Cypress Ridge. Okay, you've heard the recommendation. Is there a motion? Okay. That failed for no motion. So you can, board members. Some, you can make some other motion yep. now related. Anybody want to make a motion? I'd like to make a motion that we, we direct uh, staff to go to the second on the list of okay. construction managers as quickly as possible. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, stop. I wanted to add one more part. Go, Mr. Matthias, go. No, 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 no. And, and the only caveat I would say is that because we are so time sensitive, that time be considered in number two or number three. Like if number two says they can't come tomorrow, then move I mean something reasonable tomorrow. not <laughs> not, tomorrow. not tomorrow that's not reasonable reasonable but, but if you feel like you're being if you're being moved in a different direction then we should go to number two Sorry. I'm number two. okay oh there is four okay so you'll be going to Walton Wharton Smith and then you have Gilbane and then you have Schmidt yes, yep okay so that's your list so number two, That's Warden cool. Smith is who we'll be contacting. We, could, we get to be upfront with them in the negotiations and say that the board rejected number one because it was $4 million and felt there was too much overhead there. I think so they'll, they'll know that by watching They can stage. watch the meeting. If, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. If, if, I'd rather not have to go to number three. I want, to, I want I number it. two to be, I get it. I be in there. I get it. Okay. Anyway, leave so out, a, leave out the other motion part. by Mr. Matthias and a leave second by motion. Mr. Dodd. Okay. Any other comment? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Great. All right, we are on 8.08. .08. Mr. Gamble, I believe this one was yours. Yes, the uh, reason I pulled this is because uh, recently we did something similar to this, uh, a piggyback bid for a million dollars, as I recall, and I expected that before large amounts of that went out for renovation at schools or replacement, that something would have came back to the board uh, to look at because uh, I think with some of the things that happened that Mr. Matthias and the business that he's in would have pointed out some things that were not really practical for us to use and spend our money that way. Also, one of the things is one of the schools is fixing to get painted again in the cafeteria, and it, I think the same department painted it two years ago or had it painted. Uh, so I'm, I'm just looking at what I'm hit at out in the public and with what we saw here tonight with the teachers, you're accountable. Somebody has to be accountable. And so I wanted to bring this out, even though this may pass tonight, but still there's nothing in what was presented to us with the million dollars showing what type of equipment was going to be purchased. There's nothing in this telling us what type of equipment is going to be purchased, except it's large equipment uh, with, you know, just open areas for POs to be allowed to be done. And I just have a problem. To me, that's not good business for us not to know what's being purchased in that, that capacity. Because there again, the teachers and the, the public comes back to us and says, you're accountable for that, you allowed it. So that's why I pulled it. Isn't this one of the discussions that we had on Monday at the workshop about the amount of the purchase order that came through it would come back to the board? Yes. So it's these types of contracts that we say it's not to exceed 750,000, but whenever a purchase is made, it will come before us as long as it's over the amount specified in the policy. And, and that was already in place before the conversation we had right. Monday in a workshop, and it did not come to I us. I don't think they do all the time either, but in the past. No, it's per policy, and depending on how much it is, that's right. the policy dictates what comes back and what doesn't come back. Right. And, and I know some of the two that was given to me was one was for like 220000 the other one was up to close to 200000 And so to me, those should have came back to us to review 
to look at what was being done because is it really feasible? And the comment that I got was this is, this is federal money and they can only do certain things with it. I understand that completely. But is it practical in some of the things that they're using it for to be used in that capacity versus some of the other equipment that may be in the kitchen or some other things that need to be done and looked at that that money can be used for rather than just changing something as a setup outside? So rather than going and, and doing the purchasing and making us aware of it, bringing it to us so we can make a decision on whether it should be purchased. We, yeah, so at it's least. Like a, a construction plan, basically. Right. I mean, some of the, some of the, uh, the areas are being uh, renovated and they're having to pull out uh, and tear out walls or, you know, serving areas there that's, you know, got a permanent structure there. That now they're going to tear it out and they're going to have to go back and reform it. So, um, but like I say, it's, to me, it's just we're accountable. Mm -hmm. The public looks at us and when they go and they see these things happening and they see the cost of it, they say, you allowed this? Well, I didn't know anything about it. And then I find out, well, you approved a PO, a blanket PO, as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, when we pick it back. So when we do these things, I think we should see something there that kind of gives us an idea of what type of equipment is being purchased, you know, so for future. And that's why I pulled it, just to make that comment. Okay. I'm wondering if it couldn't even be something like what was purchased last year, what the plan is for the upcoming year, something along, along those lines? Like something, what, what are we anticipating the use of those funds to be? Well, like and we see, that's how a budget is, right. is, is supposed to be formed, is that in the budget that they do for the upcoming year, that they anticipate if funds are available that they would do this, this, and this. And I don't remember seeing anything of that nature there in their budget for this year that we're in now. So. We almost never see anything for food service. That's the biggest challenge is food service because it's largely federally funded and even to a greater degree as we move into this other program, if we do, right. that, that um, it almost acts autonomous of the rest of the board because I guess their monies have to be spent within their department. Yes. And, but there is, again, something to be said for being good stewards. And, and John, f f this isn't disrespectful or meant to be. It, I guess it is going to come off this way, but 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 when you when you spend two hundred thousand dollars for a serving line and it's all custom components that are all built in, then maybe a conversation where would it be better if these were modular where they could plug and play, and just just asking that's all. The, the vendor is top drawer, um, low temp, and they're amazing, but a completely custom that you can't change, maybe we'd want to have a conversation. That's all. So, so the board policy on purchase orders exceeding a certain amount doesn't apply to food service? Right. That's what I was wondering. I'm confused by that. I don't, I don't know, Ms. Briggs, if you, if you wouldn't mind speaking to that specifically. And I just, we've had this conversation, and I know that we're, we're working as to, to how to best bring you this information. Um, not but sure we, sometimes what to bring and what not to bring when we're it, already you know covered by policy. It's not about so. micromanaging, yeah. you know what I mean, which is almost we're on that, we're tithering mm -hmm. on that right. edge. But, but um, for some period of time, ever since I've been on the board, that I've just observed that there's at least a lack of communication between the board and food service and things they're buying and the direction they're going. So, go. so um, the item that we're presenting tonight is a piggyback bid. That means that we're, cop we're copying a bid from another uh, school district. That gives us the ability to choose um, those vendors at those prices. It, it, it helps speed um, or reduce the amount of um, time we would spend on selecting that vendor. The next thing we can do is we can get the plan as to how those um, purchases will be implemented and at which school. That is not something we have been um, asked to do before, but it is certainly something that we can get from the Food Service Department and bring forward for you to look at. Shouldn't that be done before? Um, before the purchase, before, the bid. before we approve the piggyback, um, it can be if that is. I mean, it, it, because it has not been something that we have um, been asked to do before, um, we would be um, presenting a new um, method of, of sharing that information with you. I do believe <clears throat> before the um, budget was created, or excuse me, at the end of last fiscal year, when the food service department, when we closed that funds 
financial statement. Um, Mr. Dodd does prepare a plan for how that cap, those capital dollars are going to be spent. I can go back and get that and, and send that all to you. I know that was prepared because he has to submit that to um, the federal government as part of his plan as to how he will handle his excess fund balance. So we can go back and get that information and share that with you. And if you would like to, um, I guess we can table it and bring back the plan as to how he will implement these purchases and in which schools. Okay. Is that what I'm hearing you're requesting? Mr. Campbell? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so my, my understanding of this item wasn't that we were being locked into certain purchases. It was just no. allowing us to be able to right. purchase that's right. using that's those prices. Problem. That's right. Exactly. That's right. It gives us a price. So, Right, and, and I assume that you all have researched <clears throat> what are the best deals out there in DeSoto County. Is that this is this is the best one because this is the one you want to piggyback Correct. in terms of price. So, so then, I would I would just I, I guess understand the next step would be if a purchase order was a certain amount that it would then come before the board for approval. But yeah, but that didn't apply. In part this. of the lock-in was before because again, I keep I hate going back in time but we had to buy $250,000 worth of dishwashers one time. And I wanted to see a plan and how we were going to implement the dishwashing program. There really wasn't a plan, but we had to spend the money. And I know some of those dishwashers sat for almost two years and not were con weren't even connected. And now we're just now, and this is now five years later, just figuring out how we're going to staff them. And so I get the idea that sometimes you have to, and the whole thing was, I was told in the hallway that, that we have to spend this money. And if that's accurate, it seems kind of a shame, but uh, I don't. I don't even know why I just dribbled on about that. But it, it just sounds like to me that we're trying to spend money without really a plan. But if you're saying there is one, then I'd like to see that before we approve the dollars. Okay. And, and this all goes back to the the cooler freezer situation where the well, money. I don't even go to that one. But I know. But I mean, <laughs> you have seven hundred seventy thousand dollars, and there was really no plan there either. And, and so then that money had to be spent, and that's where some of this money was delegated to be spent, I feel like, because some of the things that were purchased with it. But, you know, I, I think before we get into a big spending spree, I think the board needs to be advised as, you know, for the public to hit us, advise us of what it's being spent on. To Mr. Dodd's point, though, this is just to approve the piggyback bid. It's not to approve the spending of any of the dollars. So it says up to not to exceed so they could put in those purchase orders, right? But could we could we approve the piggyback bid tonight with the prices but then say we are there's no purchases, there's a freeze on purchases until we review the plan? The action of approving a purchase order or a piggyback would be giving... Um, them the option that, to buy. It, well, it gives you the... It gives us the ability to put purchase orders in place. Right. If you ask us to... Um, present the plan of spending prior to executing the purchase orders. We can do that. I'm just going to do that. Yeah, yeah. I think okay. It's backwards. It's totally backwards. It is. Like, why not just like the, the, table is there a, is there a, yeah why not just table it? Is there a rush on this? Mm -hmm. uh, that I do not know, John. We would have a. I, do you have a time frame? Well, we're talking about two million school supplies, so it's like you know, that would be. So it can be adjusted, then they can give us the plan. If that's what we feel comfortable with, it's fine. But, but do we, again, if it's something that we're going to have to do before school starts, approving it, we get that in place, right? And then, then you come in with the plan and we say yes or no? Right. And, and that could be done over a workshop rather than an official meeting, right? Yeah. Yes. Because we have to put this to the board meeting. So if you can come up with it by the next board meeting, <laughs> I mean, it would be just a presentation at the board meeting. Yeah, and then, then it's another week before we before we vote, and they got to get the stuff. It's probably equipment, I would imagine, right? I, I or, whatever, whatever it is, you got to order it. Right. The purpose of this agenda item is to authorize purchase under the DeSoto School Board contract. It's not to authorize any particular purchase or not authorize any particular purchase. It's merely to, if you're going to purchase the equipment that you're allowed to use this bid. So, so then we could do that and we could request the, to the plan. And have them bring it to a workshop how they plan to, plan to spend it. And then what if we hate the plan? Well, I mean, they, just in theory. They revise the plan and bring it back, but we still have an, we, they still have the ability to do this once that plan has been approved. But, but you've got a PO in place, but you don't have to use the PO. 
conference right. or whatever. That is correct. So we do have um, um, items that we have per, uh, brought to you. For instance, maybe um, professional services contracts, and we might have a short list of three different um, contractors that we could use. There's no, there is no requirement that we have a certain right. spend with those. Those um, contractors would just be in place for us to be able to execute in the event we need those services. So again, um, the approval of this purchase order um, would, or excuse me, of this piggyback would give us the ability to make those purchases. But if we understand the board's direction and that you want to see the plan prior to executing that, we can bring that back to you. But in the past also, I know in piggyback, in this particular case, uh, food service, they have used it to purchase certain it, individual units as they needed them on a piggyback bid and uh, which was already approved maybe or they just went and they researched that's what they did they researched it and found it through their supplier that they could find this piggyback bid from another county and they did that rather than doing a rather than doing a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar piggyback bid they just went and did individuals as needed so i mean to me why couldn't this be done on a site by site Rather than giving a, a seven hundred fifty thousand, why not bring it back as you know? This is what we're going to do at this site, and we need to do this piggyback bid on this county here for this amount of dollars. Because Mr. Gamble, you, you I mean, you already have contracts for groups of things like pencils and office supplies and other items like that that you do under piggybacks. You're not saying some of those are up to a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars. You're not saying you're spending 200000 if there's not a budget line item to spend the money, you can't, they can't be spent anyway. Right. So uh, if you go to, I mean, it's just a lot more paperwork and expense to, to go through piggybacks, have multiple piggyback contracts for the same item. I understand. But I'm just saying to get us where we're wanting to get to. But, but I think the plan would then allow us to understand the site-by-site -site decisions. Um, well, we keep saying a plan. It's really probably going to be a list of equipment they're going to buy. That's right. And then we're, then we're going to say, yeah, we like the idea. For? Like, what's it for? <laughs> <laughs> that's it. so. It'll allow us to discuss it. I don't think that's a really a big, huge plan. <laughs> well, somebody has went out and drew out the plan of how this equipment is going to be staged and put into in the process. So I, I think that would be what we need. We don't even know what this is. Right. It's, it, it's, it's open. Yeah, it just okay. allows us to buy at those prices, whatever's in that catalog. So step two is then we'd see a plan. If, if in or, and, and the time sensitive part of, part of this is if the intent was before school starts, then, then all manufacturers ramp up during uh, the summer to supply right. schools because it's so time sensitive. Mm -hmm. If you don't get the PO in, if you don't get the order in, we'll not have the equipment for school opening. Mm -hmm. right. So I'm willing a leap of faith to vote for this and at the workshop, we see what is going to be bought, and that would be the time to question um, the merits of it. Sandy, are you good with that? I'm good with that. Okay. Thanks, Do you have something to say? I'm, I wasn't sure if we had a recommendation yet. If Not we did, yet. I'm ready for a motion. We don't. Okay. Superintendent. <laughs> I recommend approval of 8.08, the piggyback agreement with DeSoto County, and I, we will be bringing the equipment list or plan back to you at an upcoming workshop. For the recommendation. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion. None. Great. I think that's okay. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Perfect. All right. I believe we are at our tentative approval of a policy, a school board policy. Do we have to have a hearing or are we? We are on our discussion, item 11.01. .01. I know. <laughs> Flip it over. The item before the board is tentative approval of school board policy 3.10 administrative organization. If there is anyone here this evening that wishes to speak to this particular policy, then please come forward to the podium at this time. Madam Chairman, I don't see anyone coming forward and believe it appropriate to close the public hearing. Superintendent. Recommend approval of 11.01, .01, tentative approval of the school board policy 3.10. Okay, board, you've had a recommendation? So moved. Second. Discussion? 
Okay, saying we, that. We discussed this thoroughly during workshop. Yes. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, thank you. Okay, we are on the life, AD&D, &D, and disability insurance. All right, Superintendent, you have a recommendation for us? Maybe we can start some discussion. Yeah, I do recommend approval of 11.02, life, AD&D, &D, and disability insurance. Okay, you've heard the recommendation. Is there a motion? So moved. Okay. Second. Discussion? I know we also discussed this at the workshop. I just don't want to jump, right? I've gotten sensitive to you guys. <laughs> Okay, all those, uh, you're welcome. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. All right. We are on 11.03. Recommend approval 11.03, dental insurance. You've heard the recommendation? So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? Um, don't we have to, like in the attachment for the dental insurance, it has three different options. Yeah. Don't we have to specify or something? Those are options for the employee to select from. That's right. That's the way I interpreted it. That's the way I interpreted it. Right. The employee has this menu of offerings. Those because are it's a cost. Is that right? There is a cost. I thought we had to select his oh. line. Okay, Mr. Ritter's coming up. Great. Well, there was a 1500 that was discussed. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, after, our, and I brought Josh up here as backup in case I can't answer your questions, but. After our last workshop, we were asked to go back and price adding the orthodontic coverage to the PPO plan. So we went back and we got that pricing and we took it to the Insurance Advisory Committee. And we priced out the attachments that you have to the agenda item were the original quote, the second page was adding $1,000 in orthodontic coverage and the third page was adding 1,500 in orthodontic coverage to the plan that had never had it before. So we took that to the Insurance Advisory Committee. Everyone reviewed it. The prices that we came back with are that Delta came back with are still less than what our employees are currently paying. So it's still a savings over our current plan and the Insurance Advisory Committee recommended unanimously that we recommend to the board that you approve that PPO plan with the $1,500 or the donut coverage. We felt like that was a better benefit to the majority of the employees. So that's the recommendation that's come that, forward. Is that correct? Option that is the recommendation. Okay. Okay. Right. That's what I was not clear on. <laughs> that's why you got up so in fast. The, in the yes. attachment, all yes. three of them were there. Yes. Oh. Okay. Yeah, right. Which is different. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Ritter. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I was just about to ask. Do, do we have any other questions of Mr. Ritter? Yeah, that's all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're clear. We have, a, we have a recommendation. Did we already do a motion? Did she make a recommendation? She did. She did make a recommendation. Yes. Okay, you guys are looking at me funny. We a motion second and discussion. Motion second. Right this now. is our discussion. Yes? Yeah. Is there any further discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, none opposed. Thank you. Okay, we are on the review of the Innovation Montessori Parkside Charter, and I believe I have some public input cards. Um, so I will call you guys up for public input. Well, thank you for your patience. Yes, thank you for your patience. We, have, um, we are on item 11.04, review of the innovation of monetary policy charter application. What we need to do is have Ms. Summerlin come up and okay. present whatever issues there are and then give the school the opportunity to. And I knew we were going to do that, so do you just want me to set these to the side and then? Those are All cards from, that's right. from your folks. I mean, you don't need those. We're going to give you the 30, 45 minutes to present it. You're not asking still to have public hearing cards on top of that. Right, 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 right. Right, so now that you're having the input, is that, or the, the, yeah, the we, possibility? We just go ahead and have Ms. Summerlee come up and then Mr. Arnold will present whatever he wants to do. Do both? Well, they'll be allowed to speak too. Okay. Okay, we're good. I'm sorry. He's. We're getting yelled at because we're not on the microphone. So, we're going to ask Ms. Summerlin to come up first before we do the public input. Then. Don't worry about the public input right now. Okay. Ms. Summerlin, go ahead and make Summerlin, our presentation. Good Thank evening, you, Chairman Luke, Board Members, and Superintendent. Uh, as in years past, each of the charter applications, sorry, charter applicant governing board has been invited to appear in front of you. The purpose of this invitation is to provide a brief 
presentation about the application should they choose to answer Lake County School Board members' questions and to provide the applicant an opportunity to address the school board before the final decision. That final decision should take place on June 11th when both the applicants will be placed on the agenda for final vote. Tonight we have representation from the innovative Montessori Park side and with Pinecrest Academy Tiberis. Initially, I'd like to begin with um, innovative um, Montessori and Ms. Moore. And if it was all right with you, I'd like to ask her to come up and introduce her other board members. And she also has a brief presentation. Would that be all right? Mm -hmm. Ms. Moore? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Sherilyn Moore, and I'm the CEO of Innovation Montessori. I was board president for four years. I printed out the documents that we sent in case anybody wanted them instead of the digital copies. Um, shall I give them to them now, or do you want me to wait till later? Yeah, you can, you can hand them over to them now. To Ms. Challenger. Sure. Lady on the end. And before we get the three minutes started, if I can point out all the board members and people who are in attendance, because that'll take three minutes. Um, <laughs> we have Ali Braswell here, and he's our vice president of the board. Jeremy Bellis, the president of the board of directors. Brett Casey, secretary of board of directors. Heather Kermore, who's our building chair. Behind her is Betsy Sorg, who are, is our events chair of the board. Kristen Chase, who is the board of directors communications. Uh, lead. We also have um, Kathy Tobin, who's our assistant principal at IMO, who's on for principal for IMP, and Patrice McCulley, uh, Cherico. Wow, that came, she got married a few years ago. I went back in time. Um, she is our executive director at Innovation Montessori Ocoee. We also have a number of our staff here. We have Amy Lopez, who's a teacher, and we have Nicole Tischer, who's our ESC MTSS specialist and Michelle Carruth, who will soon be the assistant principal of the high school, and Dan Troy, who is our gifted consultant and the PTO president for good measure, <laughs> Shelley. So I think that's, that's the team, and we have some supporters from that are, will speak during the public comment time. And I'm sorry, how could I forget the one most important man in the room? This is David Fishpole. He is our accountant and business operations manager. You under your presentation. You mentioned you had a presentation. Yes. Would you like? Okay. Please. Julie. Yes. Sir. <coughs> I mean, we need you to go ahead and present okay. the part of the issues that you have with their application, and then we'll allow them to present what they need to do to address okay. the comments. Okay. All right. Um, I have prepared a response to the response that they provided you all in the last Wednesday's um, email. That email was sent to the board members, the superintendent, Dr. Weisskopf, Ms. Pearson, Dr. Landry. I have gathered most of the committee members' responses and will highlight only the items that these experts feel that are still outstanding. Many of the members are in the audience tonight, however, due to schedules, some were unable to come. Just as a reminder, the Florida model application process overview gives clear and precise directions on how and what information should be provided. Specifically, it states that the narrative is the formative application to the sponsor and is a comprehensive description of the application's, applicant's educational, operational, and financial plans. The purpose of the application, together with a capacity interview, is to provide evidence that can be evaluated in itself and that the governing board has the capacity, the resources, and ability to plan open and operate a successful charter school and to ensure that for, to ensure that Lake County students will succeed. Through this process, the committee members are to rate each standard. There are three ratings, meet standards, partially meets the standard, or does not meet the standard. Two of these three ratings, partially meets the standard and does not meet the standard, indicate that at best the response lacks meaningful detail and require important additional information. The consensus of the committee was that there were critical pieces of information that were either not included or not appropriately addressed. Therefore, the committee voted to recommend denial of the application to the superintendent. Also, I'd like to point out that 
this application was received prior to the February 1st deadline. However, due to five non-substantive issues, it was returned to Ms. Moore for correction. They consisted of the font being inappropriate as by DOE rule. Uh, they submitted in 10 font, which would have made the um, document too long if it was a 12 foot, 12 foot, no, 12 font. The table of contents uh, pages were missing, the pagination to include the entire application and including attachments. And also sections two and 10 had incorrectly placed responses or mis mislabeled subsections. Ms. Moore was given until February 7th at 4 p.m. to correct. This was allowable by Florida Statute 1002.336B, which states that before approving or deny any application, the sponsor shall allow the applicant upon receipt of written notification at least seven calendar days to make technical or non-substantive corrections and clarifications including but not limited to corrections of grammatical, typographical, and like errors or missing signatures. If such errors are identified by the sponsor as cause to deny the final application. Past practice in Lake County has been that only these type of corrections were permitted. Additional substantive information has, has not been accepted in the past because as previously stated, the intent of the application process is to support their case. However, there was a consistent thread throughout the response from IMP that provides information that was not available to the committee during that application or in that application. So as I proceed through the email response, there will be sections that I will indicate when, when information was not provided in the application but has since been disclosed. Under student performance, uh, student performance assessment evaluation failed to outline adequate adequately what students should know, be able to do, and how academic progress could be measured. Um, as to the, this was clarified. So as to the lack of projection model and the accountability tool is qualitative and not quantitative in nature, uh, both items have been clarified. Under the facilities information, uh, the information failed to adequately describe the school's facility plan for acquiring, developing, and implementing that provided a realistic sense of facility needs, a timeline for securing the facility, projecting facility requirements, and provide adequate budget. Regarding the specifics, it is not required at this time for them to have all the details. However, there were comments still included that it should be noted that the response indicated that a turnkey cost of $160 per student seemed low. Additional funding was identified through the second response. Um, the pre-K program would be charged, if additional funds were needed, the pre-K program would be charged $900 per student for a rental fee if needed to fund the K-8 program. Um, it is important to note that this would be a private facility, so the contract will state it, that the district will verify that the school has conformed to building, fire, and other established requirements. As it pertains to the model application um, in section, I didn't put that down, I think it was section B, um, there were the four requirements. One of them was that they had to provide an estimate of the cost of the anticipated facility needs and describe how such estimates have been derived. They are to identify, if applicable, any funding sources that will be applied to the facility, related costs and evidence of such as an attachment U. Uh, Ms. Moore responded that she believed the attachment is not needed because they're working with school facilities development company. However, I will say that the committee felt their interpretation was that was expected. Also, um, they did clarify in the backup facility plan that they have now met with um, the landowners on that. As far as school safety and security goes, uh, the input I received on that was there was still some follow-up information that um, needed clarifying. There was not, there was, the question was, is there a model set of policies regarding a comprehensive plan? If so, who manages the standards of that training? And thirdly, how will those trainings be implemented? Regarding the budget, um, the recently provided budget data in the response has been revised, revised to reflect the correct school year. 
However, on pages 12 and 18 of the recently submitted budget, the number of students and grade levels does not reflect the same enrollment information that's on page 10 of the application. Um, again, inconsistent information was submitted. On page 25 of the seven-year projections, the same uh, follow-through, there was not the, the matching enrollment didn't um, coincide. And on page 37 of the 2019-2020 contingency report, it indicated that IMP will decrease their teacher salaries by 75 or 50 percent um, instead of reducing the number of teachers. However, um, the response states that the plan would only hire for the student count. So on the contingency, it showed, a, let's say, a $44,000 75% and then 50% salary for all five kindergarten teachers, where in the narrative it said that they would just reduce the teachers. So there's a conflict there. Uh, startup plan it rolls back up to some of the in information on the budget. And under the curriculum plan, those items have been clarified. Ms. Moore included in her response a rebuttal regarding the educational plan, even though the section was not one of the items identified in the letter. Her text suggested that the committee voted that it met the standard, so how would that, how could the other pieces have been met? The committee felt that, in fact, um, it, the committee did, in fact, score it that way. It was 13 to nothing. However, the overarching feeling of the application was they relied too heavily on Orange County. They had not pulled in Lake County statistics when it related to ESC and some of the other pieces. Um, I do not have input on the exceptional student education part. I was not able to collect that, but I will make sure that I would pass that along as soon as that's gathered. Those are my comments. Okay. And we would have, if there are any initial comments from Ms. Summerlin, then we're going to turn it over to the school to respond to those issues. You guys have any comments from Mrs. Summerlin? She'll be able to come back after the. Okay. School speaks to address you again. Great. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I believe it's appropriate. Are you going to do it? Ms. Moore is going to start. We'll call our speaker. Ms. Moore? Thank you, Ms. Sumlin, for giving us those details. And we look forward to working with you guys on kind of getting our communications in line. <laughs> I think a lot of these things tend to be just different interpretations of things um, that we might be used to doing. And I did prepare a little three minutes for you um, that I'd like to share first, and then we can perhaps engage some of the other board members, or, and like I said, our accountant is also here, who can address some of those very specific <laughs> granular um, items if you'd like to today, or we can do it in a little bit of a more broad spectrum. So um, as I mentioned before. And, and we're not going to limit you to three minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, my, my board was really excited about the timeline, so I tend to go on when I get excited about our education. So, so okay, it is gonna, three minutes. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, I got my timer. All right, we'll see. There we go. All right. Um, it's my favorite topic, so I get a little excited. I, I, I apologize. Just one second. Yes. Before we go, is there a recommendation that would at all be made about this? No. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, I am Sherilyn Warren, the CEO of Innovation Montessori, and I was board president for four years. Um, I've also been an educator for 15 years, and I have two children at Innovation Montessori, as does every single one of our board members has children at Innovation Montessori. We also have our admin team and key members of our current staff here that will answer any questions you have, um, and a few of our teachers that also reside in Lake County. We're all here to do just one thing. We'd like to share the love of Innovation Montessori with Lake County. The response to the staff position that we've started to discuss, um, and also that I emailed everyone, can best be summed up by ensuring you that we are committed to building effective educational partnerships within the home district, as evidenced by our 15-year charter renewal and approval to expand both our K-8 to 1,300 students and to launch Innovation Montessori High School in Orange County. And we reference Orange County because that is where our current school is, and this would be the next step for us. Um, we were approved because we provide an effective education, but also that we're great partners. We really look forward to our relationships and our communications with OCPS when they come in. We seek to bring that level of partnership here to Lake County Schools. 
Um, our board, this fantastic board before you, they weigh every single decision on two ballasts. It is what is best for the long-term financial stability of this school and what is best for the child. And those two have guided us to an absolutely impeccable financial record and a sound business plan. Um, we even have a letter from our auditor that we can share if you'd like. <laughs> um, our relationships with our facilities funder, Building Hope, and our Lake, owner, Lake County landowner, the Boyd family, um, they're very strong. All parties are committed to creating an innovation Montessori campus in Lake County that respects nature, honors the rural tradition of the land, and supports our school's mission. A Montessori education serves the whole child. It's naturally differentiated. It's hands-on, and it's executed with grace and courtesy in multi-age classrooms. We don't just deliver a methodology. We create a generation of engaged and inspired learners. A study from UCF found that 99% of our students felt valued and loved at school, and 90% of them understand that they're learning in order to help others to make the world a better place. That's K through eight, and that's whole child education. And that's why we can create such a vibrant and involved group of parents and grandparents who become the heartbeat of the communities that we build. 99% of our families return year after year, and over 90% of our staff does as well. And so we become a family. Families grow up together and families support each other, just as IMO will do with our sister school, Innovation Montessori Parkside. Less than a week ago, we had our first community meeting with Lake County families who really want a public Montessori choice. The love for their children and the desire for this type of education was really palpable, and it was also quite humbling. The, some of them will send their firstborn <laughs> off to a school for the very first time, and they'd like to choose our school. And we take that level of trust as sacred we can provide a beautiful and effective educational experience for Lake County families. We lead not only from the head, but also from the heart. And we ask that our application to open Innovation Montessori Parkside K through eight be given due consideration. And I thank you all for your time and allowing us to share the love that we have for bringing Innovation Montessori to Lake County. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore. And then should we bring the board here yes. or just? I, I would say individually. I. Um, Individually, it'd be great. I'm going to rely on being able to remember everything I wanted to say. But I do want to thank um, Superintendent Cornegie and Chairman Luke and the entire Lake County School Board for taking the time to hear our public comments. My name is Patrice Cherico. I'm the Executive Director for Innovation Montessori ACOE. I came to speak in support of Innovation Montessori Parkside Charter School. I've been an educator for close for 30 years. Most of those years was in elementary education for South Florida and later in North Central Florida. I am and have always been a strong supporter of the public education system and the incredible tradition of excellence teachers, staff, administrators, and school boards have brought to education into our nation. After a long career in teaching, I transitioned to administration and became a principal in 2007. During my first year in this position, my school was randomly selected for a Title I audit for instructional programs. I know, you have a smile on your face. <laughs> I called it my baptism of fire. I realized it was great preparation for the many and various aspects of compliance that the position does bring. Of course, it was a great boost to my confidence when I received such positive comments from the auditor since I was able to speak to the systematic instructional plan which included school-wide intervention that we would provide our struggling students. When I moved from North Florida to Central Florida, I was fortunate to find the advertisement for Montessori Charter School in Winter Garden. The opportunity to be a part of this parent-inspired grassroots charter school was a thrilling new path for my career. After passing through four arduous interviews, I was hired to be the principal and the executive director at the school. I quickly caught the passion for bringing Montessori education into the public domain. My experience as an educator helped me to see the crossover that the model provides with the best of instructional practices for differentiated instruction, 
science inquiry, rigorous thinking, and independent work. Now in our seventh year, we have been granted our 15-year renewal. I have also guided the school from 140 students to over 670 next year in 2018, 2019, with over 1,000 on our wait list. All the while, we have worked hard to build a strong public model that honors the best of educational practices. This is the reason I'm excited to oversee and support the future principal for Innovation Montessori Parkside. And after listening to the presentations this evening, I know with our emphasis on learning, emphasis on the emotional well-being of our students, along with the strong community connections we build, that we will be a great fit for Lake County. To end my time, I simply look forward to working with Lake County staff and building a welcoming and vibrant school. Thank you. Thank you very much. And what we've decided to do is we'll bring up some people to address some of the very specific things who are the experts in the area. I have Nicole Tischer, who is a Lake County resident. She also handles all, yes. Bob, no. can I ask just? Please. Um, you said the owners of the property are here? Yes, would you like to hear from them first? No, I just want to know where it is. <laughs> yeah, Harvard where, Harvard where is the, yeah. what's the location? We can switch, so. No, 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 just say, where, where is your land? Yeah, go ahead and come to the microphone, because otherwise I'm going to get This is Scott Boyd. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Scott Boyd. Uh, my family is McKinnon Groves. We, um, sixth generation citrus grower in um, Southeast Lake as well as um, West Orange County. And our property is located south of Hartwood Marsh Road. I saw that. I was wondering where that was. <laughs> Can you like be more descriptive, like the city that it's in? Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I don't so, know where Hartwood Marsh Road is. Well, it, if you know where Hartwood Marsh Road, it's the east-west connector between Highway 27 and it goes into the city of Winter Garden. Um, where the property is located, it's on the county line of Orange and Lake County. It's 380 acres in total. Um, one of the, just a little bit of background on myself, I was former Orange County Commissioner. I represented that area that abuts up to Commissioner Parks. And um, so I'm very familiar with how schools are incorporated with a lot of the bigger communities uh, that come online. Now this is, in the very early stages of kind of our, our family's progression on what we're going to be doing with the property. Uh, but we had talked to the Innovation Montessori School about the opportunity of being a partner within that community as we move forward with it. Um, so if you were to kind of visualize where it's at, it's, um, gosh, Har are any of you familiar with Hartwood Marsh Road? Okay. All right. So if you were, if you were traveling down Highway 27, uh, you, would, you would cross over Highway 50 in Claremont. The next uh, east-west connector road you would come up against would be uh, Hartwood Marsh Road. That doesn't get you back out to Highway 50. Johns Lake is situated uh, in between Hartwood Marsh Road and Highway 50. It's in the, just up in Windy Hill, then. Yeah. That's what I was thinking, Lost Lake, Windy Hill, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay we got it. I knew I knew the name. Got it. Okay, now, we, now I got an idea. Thank okay. You. And then right. and then the next question, and it's not for you, because now I know where you are. <laughs> I okay. know what you're doing. But essentially, Montessori schools are private schools, right? Because there's one in Leesburg that does good work, and there's one in right. Mount Dora that does good work. And so what is this Montessori public school? Because it's totally a different concept, right? And, and the only thing I know is my oldest son went there for like a week, and he, he were like a Montessori a dropout. It did not sort out for us because it was just totally different. Like it was, it was snowflakes and rainbows. So I'm so I'm going to bring up um, Kathy Tobin, who's been a Montessori educator for 20 plus years. She's also serving as assistant principal here, and will be the one to launch the primary facility for three, four, and five year olds in Lake County. So she speaks much more eloquently about how the, we've been able to marry private and public education. And that was a big uh, question when we first started seven years ago. How do you do it? And we have tested and adjusted and perfected the model, um, so much so that we've been able to even have a Montessori High School approved. So, but I'll let Kathy tell you all the ins and outs. Thanks. Hi, I'm Kathy Tobin. Um, I took um, Montessori certification the year after I moved to America in 1994, and I've been um, teaching Montessori ever since. You're completely right. Um, Montessori is typically in the realm of private schools, um, and that has been a great sadness to me. 
Um, Montessori was developed 110, 111 years ago now in um, Italy by Maria Montessori, who was Italy's first doctor. Um, she had such marvellous results that Montessori is now available on um, six continents. There are over 20,000 Montessori schools worldwide. There are 4,000 in America. Of that, only 500 are public. Um, bringing Montessori to all children, not just children whose families can afford the steep tuition that's generally um, demanded, is something that we're very, very passionate about. Um, it, its efficacy has been proven. Dr. Stephen Hughes, who is former head of the American Academy of Pediatric Neuropsychology, um, has done the brain research and shown that um, Montessori education is the method of education that best aligns with how children's brains learn, um, so much so that he has left private practice and now is a full-time advocate and researcher for the, America, for the um, International Montessori Association. Um, so we feel very strongly about spreading Montessori to all children. Um, there is a correlation done that has been done between Montessori curriculum and the Common Core Standards. Um, it's, a, it's widely available. Um, in many instances, Montessori curriculum blows the standards out of the water. It's very rich and very deep. Um, in the places where it doesn't, we're very aware, obviously, with the focus on Florida state standards. We have done that tweaking, and we know where the weaknesses are, and we know how to address them. Okay, that's I, specifically the Florida state standards. Yes. So, so you meet the Florida State standards? Yes, we exceed them in most areas. Like in, in Montessori, um, kindergarten students, for example, are doing um, addition, multiplication, subtraction, division in the thousands with dynamic regrouping, can analyze sentences for parts of speech. It's because we meet children where they are. We follow their developmental needs. We give them a lot of concrete instruction and learning. Um, so in doing that, they reach their maximum academic potential. I, th I think his questions kind of segue into mine now. I don't know if this is the most appropriate time to ask, but since, since she's up there. So I was intrigued in some elements of your application where you specifically mentioned that you do not teach some of the Florida standards and that the students would then rely on their cognitive abilities and skills when that standard is presented on the FSA. Well, um, is that I, right? Well, um, how, uh, some of the materials aren't, because the materials, generally speaking, Maria Montessori's uh, methodology has remained unchanged for 110 years. So there are definitely are standards that aren't met through the Montessori curriculum. And I think that's probably what is mentioned in the, um, in the charter. But what we have done is taken the standards that are missing and made adaptations to our Montessori curriculum to create extensions in a very Montessori way of addressing the specific standards. And where we can't make a material, then we will address that, um, uh, the deficit in direct instruction. So uh, um, I guess I have concern because then I look at how your school has performed on the FSA, right? And, and against the um, school grading, and I noticed that your Okoe school was a C last year, and largely driven by your low math scores. Right. Learning games for the bottom 25% were, were very low. Um, only 50% of the students were proficient. Um, when I look at the area you're looking at, um, C schools are not common there. We've got seven A's and B's in, in the Claremont area. Uh, so to think about bringing in a C school gives me a little bit of anxiety. Additionally, when I, when I thought, okay, well, maybe it's because you're serving every child, but you have 0% low socioeconomic status. So I, I just don't understand how you pull a C with, I, with, with, with that kind of affluence. Right. Um, well, we did um, actually miss the B by one percentage point, um, and I'm not sure that that um, socioeconomic um, ratio is an accurate representation of our community. You have to come. You'll have to come up to the microphone. There's well, another one on the other side of the room. Well, it's certainly not representative of the community, and, and so that, I guess it's the other question I've got in terms of demographics, because in your application you you uh, mention uh, mirroring the demographics, but you only cite race as an example there, and you know, 72 percent white. So, and so in on the so forth, free, we. Um, Next year, we intend to embark on, on the federal free and reduced lunch program. Up until now, we haven't done that. And so capturing that data has always been elusive to us. We um, do use E-rate, and we use an, a survey to our parents you know, for E-rate, but we are looking forward to actually having the federal lunch program support and to get a more accurate representation of our free and reduce number. Uh, now, now, math seems to be the low driver for you, right? Because ELA, high, high achievement there, if, if that was truly based on that, you'd be in A school. 
Um, when I looked at the sample schedule that you provided, it only provides a, only lots 30 minutes for math instruction daily. I, I wondered if some of that is driving it. Or are the students no, not getting enough time you know, in math? I, I think that you know traditionally in um, Montessori schools, um, in private schools, you traditionally may not see scores like in third grade. You know at math be at the level that you would want to see them. But oftentimes, by the time the students are in fourth and fifth and sixth grade, you see that jump in their performance. And in our school, um, I feel like we're still addressing some of those needs. Um, we've had a lot of new students come in, so they're not necessarily students that have been through our entire program. Um, we're always digging into figuring out what we need to do next. Um, for one of the things that I have down and I've um, asked the board to um, sponsor is we're going to have professional development from a man named Dr. Dorr. He was the American Montessori Society president for some time and he's a consultant and he specifically works in math and that's really his expertise and so he's already on the schedule for coming in um, in the beginning of next year as we really dig in a little bit more specifically to our math and what's going on with math. And d did you just say that you had a lot of turnover on students? No, no, we've added. You had a lot of new students coming because in. Because we're growing oh, so because by we've growth, grown so not much. By attrition. Okay. We sometimes have had to add students who have not been a part of the Montessori program, so they've come in at older grades. Okay. Are you AMI or AMS or neither? Neither. We're affiliate to AMS. So we're, you know, not, not certified. No, not Are certified. Are your teachers certified in AMI or AMS? Yes, we, we have all. We have teachers certified in AMS and we have teachers certified in AMI as well as um, AM, I can't remember the acronym for, there's several different um, groups that are certifying teachers those. under MACD. So are they all certified? Yes. And if they're, they are in the middle, some of them are in the middle of their training still. So, but they're all, they know that when they're hired, one of the things that they have to do is they have to um, become a part of a certification program. Sorry, she was saying something. <laughs> Yeah, so what she was just saying, um, again, one of the things that we did with Michael Dore even this past year is there were things um, within the instructional model. It's for those of you who are educators. I don't know who on the board is past educators, but, you know, there are pieces of Montessori that, it, that I brought in as a traditional um, educator in my background as a principal and looking at what good instruction needs to look at and needs to, what the elements that you need to see, whether or not it's Marzano, Danielson, whatever evaluation tool you're, you're using. One of the things that I saw is that I wanted to really bring some of those elements and have a tighter conversation around some of those elements within the Montessori lessons that the student, the teachers were delivering. So Michael Dorr also provided a lot of great connections for the teachers. We brought him in, um, three times this year, I believe, he's brought in. Um, next year when he comes in, we're gonna be digging in more deeply into math specifically. So what is it, what is the, how is this discussion supposed to go amongst the board? We're just discussing, this is just a discussion. Actually what's supposed to happen is we're supposed to be getting some response to the specific issues that, so that Ms. Summerlin brought up so that we can determine whether you, we have any issues with the application. And, and, uh, Mr. Johnson, this is what we're doing. We're, we're organizing the, the speakers that come up. We did the best we could to take notes in Ms. Summerlin's presentation, which was pretty rapid. Um, and so I'm trying to coordinate, the, get the right speakers up here. And I think we're in the process of doing that. But as the board has questions, <laughs> we want to address them as they come up as well. And then but, but this the, strikes the, me as odd because normally we would have, what I'm used to is that we would have a present, we would have information that would show the deficiencies, the superintendent would make a recommendation, and we would kind of make a motion and vote on it and discuss it. No, this is, this is being what? done differently because this is substituting for what you usually do is have a workshop, and right. at the workshop we go over those other issues, and if there are any other issues at the, at the school board meeting that we have a vote, then they're brought up at that time. This is the workshop. During a board meeting. 
Which is sort of a Montessori approach, I guess, to this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guarantee this was not our idea. <laughs> So they're they're going to address <laughs> Julie's concerns about it, and then if you have any other that. questions about it, what do we? I find it all confusing too. <clears throat> Why wouldn't we have it in a workshop where it'd be more casual? So it was a recommendation that came that we go ahead and I, it's a timing issue, I believe, is that we didn't have another board meeting to actually do the vote until mid-June, and so it was it was just a timing issue. So we vote on this in June? Yes. Before yes. we have a deadline of June 11th. For their application. Yes. For their application to be Because you don't, you don't have the land on. even being developed yet, right? Yeah, so no, you're good. That's all I needed was. <laughs> so the urgency is just for the application? We have to have a final hearing with a vote. But we could have a workshop that's actionable, too. Yes. You could have a meeting scheduled between now and then. This is a a, just a very odd format. I'm sorry. It's just weird coming up to the podium. Rather than just talking, we're up and down. Well, actually, the difference is they're usually sitting right exactly. here in the district office and we're listening to them talk. I don't know if those microphones work, though, so. But I also don't even know if they were if they were to answer specific questions. Did y'all do that? Like, shame on you about the font thing. That annoys me. <laughs> no. I'm being a little facetious. But but have y'all answered the questions that were of concerns? So, so we got some, there were, we got the letter from um, Ms. Summerlin and we sent responses back. There, it's pointing out specific places where we believe that information was missed or perhaps uh, didn't see it. And so then I think all that is in pro, has been in process. So I'm not sure, uh, we, we would really prefer an opportunity to, to have uh, discussion not in this format and, and, and uh, Julie is that our workshop you have the information now from them the response that you received right on Wednesday I took that and I spoke with right and that was what I just read through those seven items right and so some of them they cleared I uh, cleared up mm -hmm. but do you do a committee it, again it's just it's okay. to make sure things haven't changed you have a committee that's looking at this, yes? The committee already so, met, yes. And they had an opportunity to see their responses, yes? No. No. I, the yeah, because expert, I'm used the to committee, them making a recommendation. No. So they have. If I, can, may I? Do you, yes. Is that okay? So they, they met. This committee met. They were supposed to. This, and please stop me if I'm misrepresenting. But from my understanding of this, this committee did not have all their information to our committee in time. Our committee got together. They reviewed what they had. And then just this week on Wednesday, we received all of the documentation necessary. And now it's their chance to come back and rebuttal, even though they missed the deadline. And our committee has already put in all of the work reviewing everything. So no. Mrs. Summerlin's committee hasn't had the chance to look at any of this, but Mrs. Summerlin did go back and say, okay, this one was here, this one was here, even though it was after the deadline. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense to me, except that it's just all out of whack to me. It, it's, it's, it is. It's wonky it, right it, now. Committee, but, and I appreciate us working with partners, just so you know, like, this isn't like, I'm not hung up on the date thing. But it would seem to me appropriate, because I want to hear from those people that really get into the, the nitty-gritty and make an evaluation. Because right now, if the evaluation is no from your committee, and you guys are just going to stand here and talk to us about how you fix things, that wouldn't quite fly with me. I'm just telling you. Right. That That's be, right. We'd be better off right. because we're going to kill about an hour doing this and end up with nothing. That Wouldn't it be better for them to supply the information to your committee and that your committee comes up with a recommendation like I'm used to, then you guys come and sit before us, and we hash this out. But there's a deadline for their committee, and, and they don't meet again until next right. year. So Next year. Right. It's passed. <laughs> it's passed already. That's right. Hey, but so you, let me but clarify. You, you know their names, though, right? They didn't. They do, they didn't and I they shared, didn't. When they responded to you all on Wednesday and sent that email, I took that information, and I sent it to Ms. Cole. I sent it to Mr. Carr. I talked to her finance. I took all their pieces, and that's how I came up with, okay, the committee, that expert in that field, is comfortable. That's why I can't report to you about exceptional student education, because I couldn't get all those. There was three people I was trying to get input from. So that's why I said I can't give you that. But I can give you the piece on the budget. I can give you the piece on the facilities and the startup plan. The piece on the assessment, that person 
passed. They clarified, and like Ms. Moore said earlier, there was some, there's some, just some vocabulary that we weren't clear on. But they also did provide additional information, and that kind of goes back to the statute, and that's why there's a difference in statute that districts have to take non-substantive information. And in the past, the dis this district has never taken more reports, more, you know, if the budget didn't meet muster the first time and you have to re-explain it and you didn't do things right, the committee wasn't in the position to say, okay, we'll take it. If the board decides to take that additional information, that's up to them. Almost every time we get into, because of the structure of the charter, charter world, mm -hmm. we get into the construction costs and that debate every single time. And, and that structure. So maybe we ought to look at how we're even asked that to be presented to us. But financial stability is terribly important to me, just so you know. And that, um, and that's sort of the focus. The rest of it, there's way smarter people to talk to you all about the curriculum. But it's just an odd way of approach. I'm just telling you this, this is very odd to me that in the past we've had very specific recommendations and very specific um, deficiencies that then we sat around a table and you all sorted it out or you didn't sort it out. Mr. Matthias, Julie has the very specific deficiencies. It's just you don't have a list of them sitting in front of you, but she read it from it earlier this evening, the ones that are still, they're going to get caught up because some of them are cleared up and some of them are not. But we didn't, they didn't have nothing. I mean, this is the stack of paper that the committee had. No, and the committee, based on that, said no. Right, and then, and then, and then the school sent in additional paperwork, which Julie has been trying to vet through everybody to see if they were, if it was good or bad or whether it resolved the issues or not. But in the past, that again, the deficiencies were also set through the committee, or am I? No, sir. What you're thinking of is when we had the board workshop, right. experts would be in the, in the audience, and so if there was a budget something and I hadn't had this conversation with uh, Ms. Briggs, she would come to the table and she would say, well, you know, on this, they've said this, however. Um, so they would come to the table. So I tried to, because we were not able to get the timing with the board workshop because it's May and we only have one board meeting and try to, and there wasn't a board workshop that was planned. So this was how we were handling it. Um, so I, once they sent that response, Ms. Moore sent that response to y'all last Wednesday, I took that and I got input. So then, typically they would have been Based here. on that input, what would, you, this is the input you're talking about, this right here. That is what they submitted to you last Wednesday. You reviewed this? Yes, sir. And Not personally, but I mean, personally, yes, but I also had the experts involved. Okay. And is the thumb up or down? It opinion? depends on which way you land. On the assessment, <laughs> well, the budget and the facilities, no. Right, and that's important to me. Well, also, I'm really concerned with the fact that we've had really, we all know, really bad charters come before us. And for your information, I couldn't be a bigger fan of Montessori. Um, but um, we've had really horrible charters come before us and our committee had, has had to pass it and then we have to fight it. And if we break precedent right now and allow right. a charter through that is giving us stuff in May, we're gonna be, we shouldn't be making this decision. This is, this is now like something like 800 pages of stuff that Julie has had to read. <laughs> Well, and, and the other experts, I mean, yeah. you know, it was quick turnaround. Like it has to go, it, it should go through the committee because that's why there's the, the committee process. And I'm concerned with setting a really bad precedent. So, so other districts approve these charter applications without the other 200 pages of information? I'm pleased. The different yes. that are up here. Thanks. The particular reason why you got an addition from the school's perspective is that there were items that were in the application that were simply missed by the committee. And if you read the item, if you read the, what we put in there, there were statements like the startup plan doesn't include budget. Here it is, and that if you read the letter that we sent, it says it is, it's here. So it's very unusual to have a situation where we're standing before you in this setting where all the items haven't been cleared up. And this isn't an issue of where we're saying that we have a philosophical disagreement, okay? And there's nothing Mr. Um, Johnson and I have to discuss that we have a legal, that we, we disagree with your legal interpretation. This is simply things were in the application that were missed. Things Just that were us. very, I'm sorry? Just by us? Yes, sir. By the committee. By the committee. Yeah. And so we yeah, are not. Accurate. We can. Is that accurate, Julie? 
Yes. For example, the math. There was, in the application, it said Algebra 1A. Well, to our group, Algebra 1A, you have to have Algebra 1B. Ms. Moore clarified in her, in her response from Wednesday, that's what they call their algebra because it's an honors class. So they may assume that we missed. It was just a matter of, you know, vocabulary. I, I'm not going to say the points that they're referring to, there were, those come from the app, from the evaluator's instrument, and that's comments that our folks make. So there's 13 of them. I don't vote. I don't complete one of those. So we just take what they say verbatim. Okay, maybe next year we need to give better direction. Um, I know that there was one section on textbook, and uh, Ms. Moore referred to, you know, it is on page XY1. Well, it wasn't. But instead of going into the weeds with you all, because I understand that your time's precious and you didn't need to hear all that, the big picture was there was a budget. The starting budget was there, but it was inaccurate because of the fact that they used the wrong year. So, you know, the, that went back to the withedness of the, the committee, I mean, and who put it together. So those were some of the thought processes that were taking place in that committee meeting that day. Um, and like I said, they pointed out a lot of time they referred back to IO, IMO, the COE branch. They didn't look at Lake County statistics. You know, they didn't do that. Um, I did ask them at the capacity interview, you know, are you replicating IMO because they constantly talked about it? But they said no. Um, I did ask for clarification if this was going to be a development type of situation because statute does require them to if the developer wants to put property up, then we have to make sure a percentage of seats get saved for that. That was not the case. So we talked through a lot of that. Um, you know, that's, I'm not going to sit here and say that we didn't misunderstand or miss something. If you misunderstand, wouldn't you call then and try and get it clarified? But I didn't know we misunderstood because oh. to us, Algebra 1A is Algebra 1A. I mean. I see. And so let me ask this question just to get right to the point, because I agree with Dr. Burns about the precedent that we can't be receiving documents from May after the charter. But is this just going to be something then that delays the start by a year because they're going to come back in February with a completed application and we're going to have to approve it? So are we just delaying a start time? And I'm, I'm not, by no means do I mean this, but do you, you guys understand? Because we've also been forced to accept charters after we have just really none of us have been on the same page. So if this is a partnership that is a positive one that's starting from, you know, this misunderstanding here and there, and we're just delaying their startup a year, I just want that to be a consideration too, because you know they're going to come back if it's just a matter of these documents being missed on the application. So just to consider. If, if they're good partners, they're good partners, and, and whether it's today or tomorrow. Right. What I am concerned with is I'm concerned with the precedents we're setting, and I'm also just it's just odd to me. Just we're sitting here, the, the wrong. It's everything's out of whack for me on this. <laughs> All right, we got that. We get that. We're good with you, Mr. Thomas. Go ahead, Dr. Burns. It's confusing because they're they're recommending denial. That's right. that's what's confusing, and typically it is more of a conversation. We we're not up against a deadline, and so I guess, Ms. Summerlin, the the original application, everything was it submitted on time? Did they meet? It was submitted. Yes. Everything was submitted on time. It was, it was a submit, yes, as, as it was. And on board docs, that app, original application is there. Second version, when they made the changes. The information you got on Wednesday is additional information. And granted, some of it was clarifying, that math course, that clarified it. So, you know, those kind of pieces were brought in. Um, we go back and, and as I explained to the committee, you know, philosophically, whether we like Montessori or not, if the, it does the job, we, that's not the district. The sponsor can't control that. The sponsor does have an oversight, though, to make sure the money's in place and that they have the facility. Now, we can't tell them, you got to tell us where the facility is and all that, but they have to have an understanding, and that's where attachment U was huge because it didn't, that was information. Attachment U? It still was not submitted because Ms. Mrs. Ms. Moore's philosophy or understanding was it wasn't required. And we've, we've always, the, the way the application says, if you have property and if you don't have property. 
So if you don't have property, there's a different set. And so we want to, they don't have property, so these are the requirements. I'd have to rely on Mr. Johnson, and I'm kind of putting him on the spot here, whether he lands on it, and he may have to do more research, but we've always had it, even all the other charters, when they haven't had property, they've always provided it. Is there a reason you don't have the? Uh, it, because it hasn't been negotiated yet. It's not, it's not done. We, we, but it's, know, we, we know where the property is going to be. We know who we're going to have it with. But the final deal hasn't been hasn't been negotiated and done. So you don't own it. No. Is that what you mean? This gentleman, Mr. Boyd, right? Is that, he owns it. Yeah, he, he owns, owns it. He's he owns the land. He's probably going to build a building, and they're probably going to rent it back because that's what I do if I own the land. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what you know. So, so I, I mean, we, you know, again, the the reason why, and and again, I think a workshop would be great. We'd love to have an opportunity to sit down and talk about it in a format that's not this way. And we can lay out why this process got derailed. We did not submit additional information. We added some clarification, but the big part of what's in there, which is very unusual, is we had to go back and point out to places where we believe that the committee missed information that was in there. And we can continue to have this talk, but at this point, all I can do is go back and play the tape of what she what she presented to you to see where we are. And I think if we have a conversation with, with Ms. Summerlin and, and, and whatever well I can uh, play with that, we, we can get to the point of deciding whether we agree or disagree and, and whether we think that you have good cause to deny us. I'm not even at the point where I can advise my client about that yet because I don't understand the issues that are here. When we got the evaluation instrument, there were six areas that says that partially meets and one says do not does not meet. Generally, if you have a does not meet, that's not going to get through. Partially meets, you can discuss and see if you can have a consensus. The does not meet for the startup plan, we vigorously disagree with that that information was in there. And so that's why this, you know, we're sending information back and forth at the last minute. And I understand what's here in the, in the legislature and their wisdom to give us an 18 month um, window didn't contemplate the fact that this falls right at the end of the school year. So we're having this issue in all kinds of different counties. My, I mean, I have the pleasure of representing a lot of charter schools in your county, but my wife and I practice in 32 counties across the state. So we have this issue in a lot of different places, and this is really bad timing. Um, but, you know, I also understood the reason why, because they wanted the schools to have 18 months to be able to open if approved. So I get that. I've spoken with the team. We are not I don't know if, if the reason why we have a June 11 deadline is because you think that we're pushing the 90 days or anything like that. We're not. I mean, we're willing to waive whatever times we, we need because we're not in a situation where we have to have it built by a certain date. We, we can, <clears throat> excuse me, we can work within the deadlines that we need to. And, if, and if, we, if we need to talk about waiving some kind of deadlines or extending some, we'll have it. But I would much rather have, I've had discussions with, with other clients, with you sitting in you, you know, your, your school board, having a discussion. And this, the public meeting is just not the, a conducive way. And it's not anybody's, I don't think it's anybody's fault that we're in this situation. Is there a way that we're going to do this at a workshop? There's no waiving. There's no discussion. There's no um, recommendation of approval, correct? There's no end to this. You're trying to waive the time frame? There is we want, no end. We want to end it. We this, really this, the time frame? Is that what we're discussing now? <laughs> well, I got a question real quick, though, while they're discussing that. Uh, it says it's going to be the 18 19 school year? No. 1920. No. Oh. No. Okay. Because what I read, I thought I saw 1819. That'd be August. No, we're in that. We're in the 18th yeah. cycle for right. education. Mr. Johnson. Okay, because I, I thought that was on the schedule, 180 day schedule, 1819 is what it said. We need okay. to have an opportunity to review the issues that still remaining with Julie and the school representatives to find out whether those issues are just a delayed understanding or some omission in the application and I'll point out at the beginning my biggest concern when I only had the opportunity to look over what Julie found out this afternoon but I'm concerned about the facility part of the application that that's accurately completed but there may be some reason why it's completed like it is so bottom line is that we need to sit down and talk with the folks before we and, and if you want to have them come back and explain it, then it should be in a workshop setting. 
if you or you can just have them come back as at the vote but I would think that you would want to hear what we found out before you get to a meeting where you're going to take a vote on it yeah you think yes duh but I also I with whatever this committee that only meets once a year but it's district people right so we can find them that I'd like for them to have the access to the information if we missed it if we missed information that was provided to us the committee did then let's have the committee also I, that means a lot to me what they have to say mm -hmm. the committee mm -hmm. and so uh, and then we have a basis for you guys to respond one more time I will tell you that if your budget and your construction costs don't jive then that's when I get sideways everything else is is down here I but I know your priorities priorities <laughs> okay Okay. So looking at the calendar, twenty eighth being a holiday, um, we have the Monday prior to the eleventh, which is the meeting in which this item would be up for a vote. If we want to plan to do a June fourth workshop. Okay. Sure. Okay. All right, so we'll see you guys then. Thank you. So the, Thank you all for coming, by the way, and thanks for waiting. Yeah, it was a fun night, I'm sure, for you. <laughs> <laughs> so the next item, review of the Pinecrest Academy to Barry's Charter application. This one is a little different because this one, the, the committee was recommending approval. So there, we, there are no lingering questions. Is that correct? That's correct. The only thing that I, was noted was after the committee met, um, I, re, I had received a call from Academica, Mr. Baruso, and he said that they may want to postpone the opening of the school. So I just wanted that um, out there, and I was going to ask that if you wanted to clarify what their intent is at this point. But yes, you're absolutely right. The committee recommended. We'll be recommending approval. He wants to yes, delay right. from the date of the the two, one of the two years delays that he's entitled to or is it delay no. the whole contract I would the what the message I got instead of <laughs> oh you can you can stay right there just you're fine wherever you want to go I'm the chairman of the board of Pinecrest Academy, and I'm here with two other board members, Shani Sadesky and Carlos Alvarez. Uh, we were intending to open in 2019. The location that we have is in Tavares, near the hospital, and it is our understanding that there are going to be some structural work that is in that area to get water, et cetera, and that in order for us to open correctly with a full building like we like to do, we would be better off for 2020, which is within the two years. Okay. Okay. Are you going into the Attawa? I'm sorry? The Attawa construction, the construction where Attawa is, behind the hospital? Near the hospital, yeah. yes. Adjacent to the hospital. There's another microphone on this side if you want to come up. I saw you come up to speak. Yeah. Go ahead and take that. No, yeah, the construction will be done on time, but we were a little bit scared about 2019. And that's why we're postponing to 2020. Because of construction that's going on. No, there's, there's water. You, would you mind walking? Sure. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. I think it's because of the water. It's basically, water. roads, roads, and uh, water, et cetera, that is going to be done, and we can't start until that happens. And then when we, we we know for sure that everything will be okay for 2020, but it was a little risky. There's a to go for 2019. It's going to take about seven months. That's why. Yeah. Construction has nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with us. Correct. Now. So you're just recognizing that there yeah. would be that delay. Correct. It's accessibility to get to it. These yeah. have been good partners. I yes, they have. Right. That's fine. Okay. okay. Thank you for explaining. Questions? No. Anybody? Mm -mm. Okay. So this one will stay on the agenda for the 11th. Correct. Correct. Oh, this we're just going to talk about. Today. We're just talking about this one, too. <laughs> the review yeah. of these documents, yes, <laughs> for these two items. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Very much. Thank, thank you. you guys for coming and for waiting Thanks as for well. Coming. We appreciate it very much. Okay, we are on 11.06.
Mr. Johnson. Oh. matter before the board is uh, approval of instructional materials for health and physical education 6 to 8 science K12 and advanced permanent oh, excuse me advanced placement biology chemistry environmental science and physics grades 9 to 12 if there is anyone that wishes to speak to the approval of these instructional materials please come forward to the podium at this time Madam Chairman, I don't see anyone coming forward. I believe it appropriate to close the public hearing. Superintendent, do you have a recommendation for us? So if you recall, you are voting for the approval of the adoption, not necessarily the purchase. And I know Ms. Pearson was going to bring back some information in regards to the options, if, if you recall, from the board workshop. If we... We are voting, though. We are going we are to voting. vote in just a minute. <laughs> just on the adoption portion. Just on the adoption, just on the adoption, just on the adoption yes. Adoption. And she was going to bring back some information in regards to the um, options that she presented. Yes. Good evening. I will be very brief. Um, we did provide you with the survey link so that you could review the surveys as requested from the prior workshop. Um, what I have before you here, which is coming um, down the line as well, is the blue areas were the instructional material options that were presented to you at the prior board workshop. We did go back and get some additional information based on some of the recommendations made at the workshop. And in the bottom row where we had the projected cost of consumables being at about 1.3 million when we take out the science consumables that would no longer have to be purchased with the um, adoption resources that we have on schedule to purchase it brought down the cost to around seven hundred and sixty two thousand dollars and we have around seven hundred thousand um, dollars right now in our instructional materials carryover um, we also looked at the consumables that um, we want to work with schools to help further reduce that cost. Last year, you may not um, remember, but Mr. Mock brought to you the audit from the Instructional Materials Department, and at that time, about $500,000 were saved. That's why we do have this roll forward um, money, because with the addition of that textbook manager and the use of the Destiny system, as well as working with the textbook managers to only order consumables that were needed as opposed to consumables for every child enrolled, um, $500 was able to be carried over into this school year. So we will continue to use that procedure um, this year in ordering. We anticipate about um, $762,000, but we also are going to work very hard to have a cost savings there again this year with ensuring that we're only ordering those materials that are necessary and if there's surplus in schools that they will not order again. So we present an option five. The option five, now that we know that the consumable costs will be um, um, less than what we anticipated, we think that we can get the bundle for all grades, three through 12. We still can't accommodate the K-2. We look at that as probably being a gap year unless something happens with um, procurement or additional funding coming from the state level. But we do think that we could cover the uh, advanced placement courses that were referenced in the board workshop, the additional courses, as well as the additional science courses for the high school. So we anticipate a between option one at maybe a 2.1 purchase and option three at a 3.1 purchase, depending upon when funding is secured. But we will work from a priority standpoint of ensuring that we get the option one priorities that we discussed and then we would add in the additional high school courses along with the additional AP courses and if we have the opportunity to add the K2 that would be the last um, priority that we would fund and we would be able to fund it all if so so you see on your agenda item that we're asking for a between a 2.1 to a 3.1 and allowing us the flexibility to prioritize when funding is made available with the options that we um, share with you in the workshop. And again, this is funding that can only be spent. Yes, ma'am, categorical. Adoption of books. Yes. Basically. 
Is it supposed to be 3.1? The three point is really um, three. The 100 was what we put in there because um, Mr. Weeks, if you remember, discussed the $100,000 from the instructional materials dollars. It's not on your agenda item because it's not for the cost of science materials. But we did put it here because we wanted to make sure that we're allocating based on that so that you could see the full picture. Oh, wait, no. Yeah. See, see here. It's that's, that's off it, by 100. So, right, right. Because it is, but it's the Chromebook um, securing from the instructional materials, but not going towards the science um, materials that, and the health materials that are referenced in the agenda item. Yes. <laughs> a little slow. <laughs> no, it's fine. I understand completely. So we see the fiscal impact on the agenda, but that's only the total cost. We're not actually approving that money. It, we, well, you are carrying forward that we would have a cost between those two numbers at some point and allowing us the flexibility to prioritize. So it wouldn't exceed 3.3 .3 or 3 million, and it wouldn't be lower than two. Right. So we are looking at um, giving giving us that flexibility, knowing that we're going, we're trying to accommodate option three, hopefully option five, because that gives us a better um, return with regard to instructional materials. But based on funding, we might have to reduce down to option one. So we are asking for a bit of leeway. Um, with regard to knowing that it's going to fall in, into those areas, but we haven't secured the amount of funding yet, and we need to work with finance to make sure that we stay under budget. So based on the size of this PO, is this one that would come back to us for a vote on when you're going to execute that purchase order, or do you all just go with it? This is the flexibility to go with it. Yes. Giving them the, okay. the regard to order the textbooks. And it's a 10-year adoption, so if we don't adopt books... Yeah, we're, we're saying that those books that we saw at the workshop yeah. are the books that they can have the ability to buy in the next 10 years. But if we don't say yes to those books, then they don't get any books for any science books for 10 years. Uh, no, no. In five years, there's going to be another adoption, right? Yes, it would come up for adoption. We didn't. We would not have to make right. an additional purchase at that time. But it's five years. okay, but sorry. it's been 11 years yeah. right. since yeah. the previous. Material. It was five years. It was 2011. It was 2011. We did have a science yes, 2011. I did clarify that. Yes. And I went to yes. send an email, and I couldn't find Dr. Face's email. I was, like, on my phone or something. But well, it was 2012 2011. copyright date Eight. on it. So right. no way that could have been done in 2007. Right. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Kind of nice. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. good that it's a five-year adoption cycle. It is. Are there any other questions, Superintendent? Recommend approval of 11.06 instruction materials recommendation for health and physical science. For the recommendation. So moved. Second. Okay, so I have a motion, uh, a motion by Mr. Dodd and a second by Mr. Mathias. Okay, is there any discussion? Are all those in favor? Aye. Aye. None opposed. Thank you. All right, Superintendent. I will refrain from comments this evening. I will defer them to Monday's workshop. We will have a workshop on Monday, don't forget. We are going to bring to you some options and discussion in regards to some school safety issues that um, we've been working on and bring you some additional information. I do have one thing that I want to do tonight, and that is introduce you to our new CFO, Mr. Scott Ward, and he's here. Um, I sent information <laughs> about him early. <laughs> what was that? What a great meeting for you to be here for. Like, you know, hopefully he'll be, hopefully he'll be <laughs> back tomorrow. Um, you've heard your task. <laughs> um, I send information specifically about his experience, and um, we are very thrilled to have him. I know Ms. Briggs is very thrilled to have him, and so we welcome you. Thank you for being part of our family, and um, I don't know if you wanted to say anything for the evening and closing remarks, just... Thank you. Yeah, we'll see how That's that works it. out. <laughs> so you are staying? <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's all your fault. We don't have any money. <laughs> Already. And we had one letter of condolence <laughs> sent to Molly Mancuso. She's a fiscal assistant in VPK in our curriculum department, and she lost her father, Clarence Johnson. Thank you very much. All right. Mr. Mathias. I was going to wait, but I do have to just say one thing, that I was honored Wednesday night to receive the Public Service Award by the Chamber Alliance. But most importantly, I, I was honored to have all of you guys there, with the exception of Christy, but you were out of town. But 
but and my mom absolutely loved every one of y'all. <laughs> that meant more to me than than uh, than you, you'll ever know. So thank you guys so much, and that's it. Dr. Burns. Um, I wanted to thank Representative Sullivan and Grand Robinson for their big wins this year. Um, I wanted to thank all the teachers that came and to ask those teachers to please this summer, because summer is when representatives are available, please sit down or if you can, if you're able to go and have an actual sit down meeting with Representative Sullivan, you saw she was, she's a kind person. <laughs> um, uh, Representative Baxley, um, the candidates, I don't think Representative Sullivan has somebody running against her, um, but, but Representative Metz has several people running against him, and discuss public education with them, because your stories... He's a judge. He's a judge. Yeah, he's he's a judge. A, he's, sorry, running to, running to fill Representative Metz's spot, because yeah. the, um, the, the importance of public education really needs to be brought to... Tallahassee um, because for example we got 47 cents in un unencumbered funds for this upcoming school year so we don't expect any sort of windfall to happen anytime soon but we do need your help with getting that message to them and sitting down with them and having a talk if it's at all possible would actually make a real impact um, if not send letters um, other than that, um, I had the privilege of going to the Top Scholars Luncheon, which is like the, the brightest kids in all of Lake County, and to the Leesburg High School Academic Excellence Awards, which were the super bright kids from Leesburg High, and, they, and both of those events were wonderful. And then Leesburg High School had an absolutely brilliant uh, pep rally that was just a lot of fun to celebrate all of their um, uh, non-academic um, athletics <laughs> scholars. So that's all I have. All right, thank you, Dr. Burns. Mr. Dodd. All right, uh, two items. Uh, first one's the quick one, and that's just sharing with the public that on um, Wednesday evening, uh, Commissioner Sean Parks and I are doing our next installment of the Coffee and Conversations, but we are going to do it at 5.30 in the evening until 7.30 to try and be able to be accessible and available to a crowd that normally can't make our morning sessions. Uh, we're going to host that down at the uh, Cat Cafe in the Four Corners area. Uh, once again, that's not really a structured presentation from 5.30 to 7.30. It's just an opportunity for folks to come at their convenience um, and, um, and have some one-on-one -on -one or some small group dialogues with your county commissioner and uh, your local school board member. Uh, the other item, um, I'll, I'll take a, a few extra minutes on this one, and that was, uh, tonight was a good reflection, uh, a good opportunity for me to reflect um, on, gosh, probably the last seven years, uh, right? Because um, seven years ago, um, I made the decision to become a teacher, and um, it, it's funny, as, as, I, as I heard so many people describe the life of a teacher, I thought, it can't be that bad, right? I mean, I, I live with a teacher, she's incredible. Um, Gosh, my wife is just the shining example for me of, of seeing the impact of, that a teacher can have on students. And I thought, I want to be part of that. Um, so then I, I became a teacher, left the business world, and I found out, yes, a lot of the nonsense and silliness that people are talking about, it really does exist. And so then I said, it, it, I, there were just so many things that drove me crazy that were coming down from the school board. And I thought, okay, I can be part of, of changing that, right? So, so then I ran for school board, and I tell you, in the last few years, I found out who our real enemy is. And I know that the folks up here are not that enemy. Um, I look to Tallahassee, because that's, that's where we're, we're missing the support. I think we've had an extremely friendly Lake delegation, and case in point tonight when we hear from Representative Sullivan highlighting the successes that she fought for for Lake County, that's fantastic. But unfortunately, we don't have the rest of the state necessarily on our side. Um, I mean, take, for example, this, this current year fiscally, what didn't the FRS re required contributions basically negate any sort of budget increase we saw? effectively resulting in a budget cut for us. And then we look at, uh, and you just alluded to it, um, next year's budget where the legislature would have been better off financially sending each student with a postage stamp than giving us 47 cents. Um, and then on top of that, um, you look at the, the safety challenges that uh, the legislature has put forth for us. Certainly, once again, best intentions uh, in trying to ensure that the safety of our students and anybody who steps foot on our campus can be, um, can be protected. Um, and, and then I got excited when they attached some, some money to those initiatives. But then, it, you know, it's, gosh, it's, it's unfortunate because it's like you open the, the envelope and see the check, but then behind it you see the bill. <laughs> and the bill it far exceeds the check, that, that what it's going to cost us to, to do, uh, it, it once again negates any, any sort of effort, that, uh, any sort of ground you were making up financially. Um, 
so this is it, 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 it's, it's a struggle and a challenge for me. Once again, how, so many times we feel um, that our hands are cuffed here at the local level, even though the legislature seems, and, and through statute, you seem to feel like you have so much control. When you read the statutes, how many uh, 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 authorities uh, you receive as a school board and so many decisions you can make, but in reality, they're, they're within so many parameters and guidelines that you really don't have free choice. Um, it seems like through every twist and turn, the legislature has found ways to make um, being a teacher miserable. They found ways to, uh, to to try to erode the stability of public education. Once again, under the guise of providing all these options and uh, and choices. And and I I love the idea of choice, but you gotta you gotta keep investing in in this choice, right? And I just don't see it being there. Uh, the Daily Commercial ran an opinion piece, which I think is spot on, and that is uh, encouraging. Tallahassee to get back to work and revisiting the, the school safety issue. Um, I, I, I would love to see them go back to work and put some adequate funding behind that, um, recognizing that our teachers, none of our faculty, none of our staff have raises this year so far. And, um, and when you get to some, some security initiatives that once again set you further back, I just, I, it, it's, it's hard to recover. It's hard to recover from that. So I don't know if this board is able to um, speak with that voice and just encourage Tallahassee to go back to work and provide the adequate funding, but I, I'd love to see that happen. Thank you, Mr. Dodd, well said. Mr. Campbell. All right. First of all, uh, today I was at uh, Claremont there for the STEAM for the fifth grade and uh, Grassy Lake won. Eustis Heights came in second and Tavares Elementary came in third. And, uh, and anyone that goes to participate there as a, uh, a runner, uh, you need to wear tennis shoes. Uh, also, uh, this past week I met with, uh, last week actually, I met with uh, 15 teachers at Tavares Middle School to discuss some issues. And uh, I told them there were some that I could not discuss because I didn't want to get in trouble with Stuart about bargaining. So uh, we didn't discuss those things, but or I didn't comment on them. But we tried to you know, work through some things and tried to settle some things that they had some uh, concerns about. Uh, also, uh, Ashley. Uh, Hi. <laughs> She's still here. <laughs> you're, you're still here. I can't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're still here. That's great. Great representation there. All right. And then Chelsea. Uh, and James also for being here and being part of this tonight. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, I won't be able to attend the, uh, the special event that will be happening uh, at Leesburg because I will be on a charter bus going to uh, Santa Fe to support Tavares High School baseball team as they are going further into the state playoffs. And so uh, weather permitting, they're going to play. Uh, but also, I, I have also received some things also on email about uh, there's going to be some, I almost used a word I shouldn't use, so I won't say it. There's going to be some shifting uh, possibly this coming Friday. If, if graduation is because of inclement weather, you can't have it. I've heard some say they may have it on Saturday. Uh, but I know then also the only alternative is, is for them to take it inside the gymnasium. And if they take it inside the gymnasium, then it cuts down the attendance tremendously so I mean what option do you take so uh, uh, we need the rain but if you ask the Lord to let Friday kind of slide get graduation over maybe he might smile on you that's all I got Thank you. and that's and I just want to say that's less than three <laughs> minutes Steve Gamble very much. Um, I also wanted to, um, you know, aside from Ashley and Chelsea, who did an amazing job representing their their buildings, and then Mr. Finley, who did also, um, the students that presented tonight did so with um, charm and a, and a topic that has been very concerning to everybody and it has, seems to be ongoing. And I really appreciate their voice being at the table when we have a discussion in our workshop next week. So, Superintendent, thank you for arranging their their voice here this evening for for everyone that was here it's, it was kind of nice to have such the audience that we did with the student representation um, voice as well I also am just kind of reflecting on this evening and and coming to terms with some of the things that were said 
um, from our from our teachers. And I can tell you today, having been at the Crayola experience with a bunch of third graders, and then seeing some of the very teachers that were at the field trip here tonight, that I I I'm 100% confident that I can speak for every member of this board that there is nobody that sits up here that thinks that because you don't come to these meetings that you, that you don't care. Yeah. We know that you care, and we hear your voice very strongly. And whatever we've done up here that would convey that kind of message to you, I would like to apologize for if that was if that was what you received in that regard. Uh, we are we are doing what we can do, and I can promise you that we will continue to do that, and that we are looking forward to working on, alongside our superintendent to bring that um, forward. So. With that said, I, I'm going for the record of the longest board meeting, <laughs> I'm just saying, this year, and meeting is adjourned.